This happened to me and my partner in September of 2023. So, we were hanging out with our two friends, husband and wife. Their names are John and Mary. They decided to camp at Todd Lake Recreation Center, which is in George Washington National Forest, and invited us to spend time at their campsite, you know, have a few beers, relax by the campfire, etc. My partner and I decided that we went up for overnight camping, but we were down to hang out for a bit. The recreation center was only 45 minutes from home, so we thought that we could drive if we didn't have but a few drinks, ate food, and chilled for a couple of hours. We get there at around 4.30 p.m., and we have camp snacks, sandwiches, chips, nothing special, and some alcoholic seltzers. We wander down to the lake, and we let their dog swim, and then we decide to head back to the campsite and start up a fire. I knew that we weren't staying the night, so I kept track of how many drinks I had and the food that I ate to ensure that I was suitable for the drive later. In total, I had five seltzers the entire night, hours mind you. And not to sound like an alcoholic or anything, but five seltzers do not explain what happened to us that night. I can definitely handle my alcohol and am responsible while drinking by pacing myself, eating food and drinking water in between each beverage. Anyway, we were hanging by the fire with John and Mary, and the next thing you know, John says, hey, do you guys want to walk down to the lake? And we respond, yeah, sure, let's do it. The campsite was a short walking path to the lake, probably half a mile away. It should only take a few minutes to get there, really, but this is when things get a bit weird. I look at my cell phone and see that it's 8.30pm and decide to put my phone in the car before we walk down to the lake because, well, I don't want to lose it. But the next thing I knew, I woke up in the woods, passed out on the ground on a trail with my partner in the middle of George Washington National Forest an hour away from their campsite and John and Mary were nowhere to be found. My partner, he was on his back with his head turned to the side and I was laying halfway on the moss and the other half on him with my head turned to the side, almost as if we were placed perfectly. We were also lost and both felt extremely confused and sick as well. We both started throwing up and had to take breaks walking out to try and find John and Mary's campsite. It took us an hour to get back and it appeared that we had hiked an hour outside of the recreation center. We both had zero recollection of how we even got there, why we were both passed out in the middle of the woods at night, and why the heck five seltzers with food over a multiple hour span made either one of us to be so sick and lose memory at the same time. My partner was completely disoriented and started screaming for help at one point. I was begging him to be quiet because I felt so sick and had no idea where we were. I guess I just needed a moment to collect myself and get my bearings to try and hike out of our current situation. Something to know about us too is that we are both avid hikers and backpackers and very comfortable outdoors in nature, even alone. However, at that moment, I was so thankful I didn't wake up in the woods at night on a trail alone. Thankfully, he was with me. But the entire time... We both felt like we were being watched as we tried to find our way back. It was really unsettling. I was telling my partner when we were trying to find our way back to the campsite that something just felt very wrong. And when we got back, we needed to get into the car and we needed to leave. I just, I don't know, I felt it in my bones, but I couldn't pinpoint exactly what happened. We were both utterly shocked though that we both somehow conveniently blacked out simultaneously like that. And look, I know what you're all thinking. We must have been drugged, right? We felt that too, but why would John and Mary, our supposed friends, drug us like that? And why would they drug us and carry us deep into the forest? It just didn't add up. Anyway, we finally made it back to the campsite and I first opened my car and grabbed my phone to see what the time is. And it was now 2.30 a.m. My heart sank. I mean, how did this even happen? 
how did it go from 8.30 p.m. when we were walking down to the lake, which was half a mile or less from their campsite, to 2.30 in the morning? Neither of us liked not knowing what happened to us in that lost time. So before we decided to leave, my partner knocked on their tent and said, Hey, John, we're leaving. What happened, man? We need to get out of here. Something's off. John then replies, Where's Mary? And my partner and I both look at each other. And my partner and I both look at each other, concerned, and say to John, What do you mean? She's not in the tent with you? And John replies, No, I thought that she was with you two. Obviously, that was when we all decided to search for Mary. Now, John said the last thing that he remembered was we were hanging out by the fire and asked if we wanted to go down to the lake. And then hours later, he woke up underneath the picnic table at the campsite, not remembering how he got there. However, something seemed fishy and he was far too relaxed. Eventually, though, we found Mary down the trail to the lake, sort of slumped over, asleep in the woods near the campsite. And neither remembered what happened and why we all ended up in these places. No one can remember what happened for those few hours that just seemed to slip by. At this point, it was misty, dark, and foggy on the mountain, and I was shivering, teeth chattering, feeling sick, and I honestly was just ready to go home. We eventually got in the car and returned to our house, but it took a while to settle enough to sleep that night. When we spoke to John the next morning, they just laughed it off and said, Haha, maybe we shouldn't drink so much next time that we hang out. I remember all of us hanging by the fire and then mentioning us going down to the lake, but I stayed back to deal with the dog, and you three went down there. John had changed his story from what he said the night before, and something just still didn't sit right with me. The Todd Lake Recreation Center was almost empty. I mean, we only saw one of the family camping that night, and they weren't anywhere near our campsite, which was also a bit odd. But my partner and I don't feel we drank enough to the point that it would cause us to black out, especially at the same time. So, what happened? We were sore and a little bit cut up, but our only thoughts were that there must have been something paranormal or maybe they did drug us. Later though, I started to get flashbacks of memory and all I remember was John's face on the beach and then black. So, did aliens abduct us? Was it something from Appalachian folklore like Mothman or some other bizarre creature? Did we actually just drink too much? Did we get drugged? My partner lost his phone that night, so I called the ranger the following Monday, and they said that they found it in the woods busted up between campsites 5 and 6, but John and Mary were camping at campsite 1. The ranger mailed it back to us because I didn't want to drive back there. I had a horrible pit in my stomach about that. The phone never cut back on, even though the front of the screen was perfectly intact. It was only the back of the phone that was busted up. And I guess that uh, a part of me just doesn't want to know what's on that phone. The next day, my partner was violently ill as well, and I was shivering with teeth chattering and chill bumps all day. Honestly, we probably should have gone to the hospital. But in my 30 years, I've never experienced anything like this. And to this day, we are really skeptical about meeting new friends or having new people enter our lives. Either way, we're both very grateful that we made it home safely that night and that we have each other. But what do you guys think? My partner doesn't have social media, so I blocked John and Mary on mine, and we haven't seen them since. We moved to another state in 2024, not because of this reason, but I've dealt with a lot of PTSD and night terrors since this occurred as well. I now worry that if it was John or both of them... Are they doing this to other people as well? And if they are, well, what should I do about it? I'm 24 now, but this happened when I was around 16. 
I was usually home alone because my mum worked during the day and I was hanging out in my room like normal, just taking pictures on my phone. When I hear my mum close the door and walk into the kitchen, I yelled out, Hi mum, to which she said hi back. A few minutes go by, but I never saw my mum go into her room, so I walked out into the living room and I didn't see her. I checked the kitchen, her bedroom, and other places, but she just wasn't home. And I never heard her leave again. We had bells on the back of our door. I shrugged it off and went back to my room. I started playing on my phone again when I hear her whisper my name right next to my ear. I freaked out and looked around, but nobody was there. I also had my two dogs with me, but they weren't reacting to anything, so I didn't really think too much of it. Once I stopped freaking out, though, I called my mum to confirm that she was still at work, and she was. That actually used to happen a lot at that apartment, where I would hear her voice. Sometimes it would be random and just calling out my name. Other times it was whispering, and it was always freaky. I have a lot more weird paranormal stories from living in that apartment, so I'll definitely share more at some point, but this one, it always gives me goosebumps. Today, someone knocked at the door and I opened it, thinking that it was someone for my parents. And all I can say is that the whole experience was just odd. There was a, a shorter lady, late 60s, Hispanic woman looking down holding some pamphlets, and a tall, I would say 6'4", Hispanic man with sunglasses and a cap wearing a leather jacket. He seemed strange since it wasn't even a sunny day and didn't even look at me when I opened the door. He stood a few feet back from the woman, looking up at the siding of the building. I looked back at the woman who was now looking up at me but still not saying anything. And that was when I noticed her eyes. They were sort of light green or grey and the pupils were like thin slits. Upon seeing that, I couldn't stop staring. I was sort of frozen, I guess, not comprehending what the heck I was looking at. My toddler ran over to say hello and instantly I felt afraid and instinctively closed the door with just my head peeking, and she still hadn't said anything. Usually, Jehovah's Witnesses, those sorts of people, will have started talking by now. Maybe she hesitated to speak as she saw that I was uncomfortable or something. After staring at each other for what seemed like forever, I forced myself to break eye contact and look down at her hand to see what she was trying to peddle. They were brochures of pictures of Jesus, and she stuttered in Spanish that she wanted to make an invitation as she flipped through the brochures in her hand, but never actually handed one to me. I would have taken it to be nice, but she didn't, so after a short pause, I politely said no thank you, and I closed the door. I looked out of the window just after doing this, and I didn't see them go to any other houses or anything. In fact, they just sort of, well, disappeared. I thought it was very strange that they would drive to my neighborhood, knock on my door, and then drive away without trying any other houses. For all I know, she was probably just a, a normal old Jehovah's Witness lady, but I've never in my life seen or heard of anyone with eyes like that, and honestly was terrified. Has anyone else seen someone with eyes like this? I googled it and came across coloboma, but it looks nothing like what her eyes look like. I mean, they were literally like thin slits. Contacts maybe, but that's weird for a woman in her late 60s to be wearing cat or snake contacts like that. I don't know, something about the whole situation just felt very off. So me and my boyfriend were playing video games in our bedroom on my birthday five nights ago for probably an hour or so. He was on our bed playing Xbox. I was on my PC, not even a foot away. 
when we finally got off of our game, we both took our headphones off and he looked at me saying, do you want to smoke a bowl? And I responded with yes and joined him on our bed. Around 10 seconds after he initially asked to smoke, he went to grab his phone and I was just looking at him. The whole house was silent as it was 11.30. But then a female sounding voice, almost identical to mine but not quite, clear as day said, can we take a bowl? I wasn't expecting to hear my own voice so I still don't know if I'm trying to think that it wasn't but we both heard it, whatever it was. It was only a few words off from what my boyfriend said so we first thought maybe a recording, a hacker, a device, relay, Alexa, maybe the cops. We truly have been over everything and it's a dead end every time. It was a different sentence altogether as well, so we got over that option pretty quickly. My boyfriend had never believed in any type of alternative universe before this, but really it's the only, well, I hate to say it, but logical conclusion. We're both convinced that this was a glitch, and in some other timeline I said that to him instead. It's happened way too many times, me saying that exact phrase, an exact scenario even in the same tone. It's the perfect setup to make us question what actually happened. Was this maybe my past best friend visiting me on my birthday, legitimately wanting to smoke with us? I've been in a hard place ever since she passed in November of 22, begging for communication or really anything from her. So could this possibly have been good reason for spirits to come right in instead? A mimic, a ghost maybe even a demon. But we both got immediate chills and we left the house to my parents' place. I was hotter than I'd ever been in my life that whole night, sweat beating down my face while I was calm days and hours later. I woke up as well to a horrible dream of me and my boyfriend in our own bed at home and in the dream I woke up, rushed to the end of the bed to see this demon figure and before I could even react, I was awake at my parents' house, drenched in sweat, shaking. My boyfriend was dead asleep at the time, and I tried to shake him awake, but it took some time before he would wake up, which was really abnormal. Now, I've read about mimics, and how they prey on those who are alone by sounding like a loved one or even yourself, but I have yet to find others like this specific scenario. How come we both heard it? and then felt the exact same. The odds are almost non-existent on the mental or physical health factor because even then my boyfriend and I would have, yes, had similar symptoms but not hallucinate the same. Fast forward to two days later though, my boyfriend and I have to fly across the country. We're visiting family. But we tried the best to put this out of our minds. Unfortunately though, I don't think I'll ever live my life the same after that but... I finally let my guard down and thought to myself, nothing can come with me, I'm safe. That was until we saw them. My boyfriend points out an older lady, very sort of witch-like, the kind you see and just know that they have way too much knowledge, that sort of vibe. But right in front of her I pointed out a man, a spitting image of a demon in human form. He had leather and chains and a cloak cape, Dressed in black head to toe, Senpaku eyes, very violent looking. He was only staring at me too, in my eyes, and I could literally feel it after I looked away too. It wasn't just him though as well. The witch lady, she was doing it too, until they had to physically turn their heads to continue looking at me. Spooky, right? Well, the weirdest thing though is that my boyfriend, he didn't see the guy. Now, you tell me how in the world he sees this witchy older lady staring at me two feet away from the man in front of her and doesn't see him? Once we shared our concerns and agreed that that was definitely not normal, I began to realize that maybe, maybe I was losing my mind or maybe I'm being watched or something. Anyway, the next day, we're out to dinner with my family and I go to use the restroom I was hesitant because it was scary to me and dark and I just didn't want to be alone, not even to go pee. 
I heard my boyfriend joking with my family about how I was scared. So of course, I thought that he was the one who came up to the bathroom door and said, psst. But in the end, he wasn't. Another thing too, maybe related or not, we just moved into this house four months ago, and ever since, I, I've been feeling just really drained, like no energy, my mood has been erratic at times, maybe I'm vulnerable or something. I'm just really so lost right now, but I'm trying to stay positive. I also want to say that, no, we were not just intoxicated or whatever. In the end, we didn't even get my bowl out on my birthday because it spooked us so bad. We also have carbon monoxide detectors in every single room in our house. They're on and working and have been thoroughly checked. No mold, no leaks. And I appreciate the concerns, but unfortunately, that's not the problem that we need solved here. Let me know what you think though. Glitch, ghost, mimic, loved one, demon. What do you think? Any feedback is greatly appreciated. We are still very jumbled up over this and don't quite know what to make of the situation. We're heading home now and I'm about to get on a plane, so wish us luck, I guess. I live a, a little ways out in the woods, on a small dirt road with a few neighbours, who also live on our small street. It's a, a quiet place, I guess. We all know each other and get along pretty decently. Given that we host little bonfires sometimes, and invite the neighbours around to grill and have a few drinks, we often discuss things that we've seen lately in our little patch of the forest. A group of lovely deer, a mischievous raccoon, or the odd wandering bear often are topics of conversation. However, inevitably, we often end up on the subject of a mutual experience most of us have had with unexplainable phenomena happening around our homes. It's really no secret that my woods tend to make people a bit uneasy. It's dark, it's quiet, and that tends to make people a bit tense. I'm definitely no different too, I mean, I don't go outside after dark if I don't have to, and I get spooked at times when an animal makes a ruckus. There are some uh, things though that I just cannot attribute to animals. To start though, I have to go all the way back to when I was 13, when I first moved onto this property. I often felt watched at night, I guess you could say. I was terrified to sleep without the lights on. I tried my best to ignore it, but I was honestly terrified to be outside at night or to be here alone. For my 14th birthday, I decided to face my fears so I could pitch a tent outside and camp in the yard with a few good friends. One of them left in the middle of the night because they were so anxious. Another left early in the morning after barely sleeping all night. The last friend stayed a couple of extra days, but was creeped out the entire time that we were there. She claimed to have briefly seen the apparition of a pale woman with dark hair as well, standing in our yard, and allegedly felt something touch her at night. She was truly terrified, and I could tell that she was being honest. Like when I tapped her shoulder once, she startled very easily and almost hit me out of fright. This was very abnormal for her, and I spoke to my uncle who lives next door about the woman that she saw, and to my surprise, he claimed to have also seen the same apparition multiple times. He wasn't even surprised when I brought it up. I moved out not long after this, but recently I've moved back here. Since returning as an adult, I've heard several stories from my family and neighbors about weird phenomena like this too. My uncle has seen the lady, but also shadow figures and heard some unnatural noises coming from the woods at night. As a man who has lived out here for over 40 years at this point, he's very familiar with the unusual sounds of animals and nature, and he didn't think that these sounds were natural. His wife has also seen shadow figures and weird masses of like black energy. She claimed to have been pushed over by an unseen force after witnessing one of these black masses of energy, and she has never gone outside at night since then. 
My grandmother claimed to have been chased by a shadow entity several years ago on this property while walking back from my uncle's place. It stopped at her front door and watched her while she cried and called my aunt and uncle for help. Understandably too, and they told her to light some sage after this. A couple of neighbors have claimed to have seen similar shadow figures, as well as the apparition of the lady on occasion. I still feel watched and I regularly cleans my house to keep, well, whatever this is, out there as far from my home as possible. A good friend of mine, when I first moved back in, called me with concerns over a dream that she had too. This was before she had even set foot on my property. She described my property perfectly and described seeing the same pale woman that multiple people now have seen. I was understandably shaken by this, considering that she'd not once been to my home at the time and I hadn't really discussed the weird happenings with her at all. She did spend the night one time, but after that just refused to do it again. My street is honestly super creepy and I've come to accept that something more is here. With all of the shared experiences, I just cannot deny that something is out there now. It's been here a long time from what I can tell, and seems to make itself known to anyone who spends enough time here. For context, this teacher was in his late 50s to 60s, and was highly respected in the small Central Californian community that I lived in at the time. He was the AP economics teacher at my high school. This took place about 15 years ago when I was a senior. I remember several weird experiences with this teacher. Like one day in class and I don't know how it was brought up, but Mr. Smith decided that he was going to give our class a mental exercise. I didn't think anything of it, but then again I was a pretty innocent and naive teenager at the time. The class went along with it and didn't see an issue with this. But I remember him saying that he was also a psychology professor at the local university. Anyway, he told the class to close our eyes and meditate for a few minutes and begin thinking about immersing ourselves in a body of water. He said that it was okay if we envisioned a river, a creek, an ocean or whatever, but he stressed that it had to be water that we were imagining ourselves in. So I begin letting the thoughts come and I imagine myself next to a creek bed throwing rocks into the water. You can stop now, open your eyes. The exercise was done. He told us to remember our visions and he said that he was going to ask each of us what we imagined. Mind you, the class was split between girls and boys so each of us go around one by one and tells the class out loud what we thought about. I remember a boy in my class said that he imagined himself in a rushing waterfall, that there were girls that mentioned that they were swimming in a lake, fishing at the pond and so on. My turn came and I told Mr. Smith in our class that I imagined myself next to a small creek. I specifically remember that he has this sort of weird grin the entire time each of us were telling him what was in our minds during this exercise. Mr. Smith finally told us why he had the class do this exercise. He said the exercise was to measure our sexuality and our uh, awakening, I guess you could say. He said that the people who envisioned themselves in large bodies of water had a high drive, while the students who were in calmer and smaller environments of water hadn't really tapped into their sexuality yet. The boy who had the vision of being in a waterfall made a joke and the whole class laughed. I just remember thinking though that it was really weird. I looked around at the class and it didn't seem like anyone was uncomfortable I guess. If they were they didn't voice it or express it. Mr. Creepy though also did this thing where he would pick on a student and ask them a very specific question from our economics textbook. If the student didn't give him an answer that he liked, he would stare them down for literally what felt like a minute without saying anything. You could feel the tension in the class too in these moments, and usually the student with the wrong answer would sink down into their seat with humiliation. Anyway, a few months later, I approached Mr. Smith after class and asked him what I could do for extra credit. 
I only took away a, a few things from this conversation. I remember him telling me, you're incredibly smart, I don't think you need extra credit. Okay, but still, I wanted extra credit. So then he says, I love your shirt, where did you get it? I was wearing a shirt with a unicorn, a yellow yield sign, so I told him that I bought it at a, a thrift store called Red Light, located in Seattle, where I'm from. He had this stupid grin on his face and asked, well, what is it? And then he said, you know that red light is a explicit site, right? Did you know anything about that? Upon hearing that, I immediately left. I later looked up the website, I admit, and sure enough, there was all the explicit material that he was referring to. Later on in the semester, Mr. Smith stopped coming to class and we had a substitute for the remainder of the year after that. I remember other students whispering in class where Mr. Smith had gone and some students were also saying that they had overheard that he got in trouble and was also now being investigated. When I was a Mormon, ages 18 to 28, I went on a mission for the Mormon church like all Mormon men are supposed to do. It was a rite of passage basically, and it was a full-time sales force for the church. You've probably seen them around, white shirts and ties, usually riding bikes, knocking on doors, trying to get people to believe in angels, giving gold tablets to a farm boy named Joseph Smith. Not much luck if you ask me. It was like trying to sell yellow snow to Eskimos, they just weren't buying it. However, I did have some uh, supernatural experiences, I guess you could say, on my mission. Had such experiences all my life, in fact. And I would like to share some of them with you guys. So, on my mission, I had a dream of a woman and baby being put into a coffin with lots of people crying. I woke up very depressed and sort of sad, and the next day we tracked it into a, an active member family who recently lost the wife and baby of the son at Ocean Shores, Washington. She was holding the baby in the surf and a wave came up with a log on it, hit her in the head. She died and unfortunately the baby didn't make it before they could rescue him. They were both buried in the same casket and they were the people in the dream. Another time on a mission, we rented a room in a house from a crazy woman who ran a boarding house for men, and a voice called my first name from the closet at night. Mind you, nobody knew my first name, not even my companion. On Mormon missions, missionaries go by elder so-and-so, and they don't use their first names. But the voice, it kept calling my first name. But how did it know that? I woke up one morning with three deep scratches from my groin to my belly, like teen tattoos. They didn't bleed, but man did they burn. The woman had no cat, by the way. A rat could have done it, I suppose, but it would have wakened me up, I think. I never did tell the woman about this, but the next day she said, Oh, by the way, this house is haunted. Well, we left the very next day. On another occasion in the city of Pacifica, south of San Francisco, we were tracked into an active smoking woman. We chatted inside his home near the front door. All he could talk about was how much of a promiscuous woman his daughter was. He heard a knock on the door though, and he opened it, and there stood a massive American Indian about 6'7 or so. The smoking woman introduced the Indian as his neighbor Joseph. And when I looked at this Indian, a voice said in my left ear, he's a murderer. I froze, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. They chatted for a minute and Joseph left. After he left, the smoking woman said, yep, that was my neighbor Joseph. He's a really swell guy. He's going through a tough time right now. He had to sell his home for bail money. He's been falsely accused of murder. We left pretty soon after that. Also in Pacifica, I lived in a small room with three other missionaries. We had bunk beds. One night, when it was raining hard, we stayed in and told some stories. The older elders, they had one story after another of their many sexual conquests in high school. I turned the discussion to ghosts at one point, 
And as I was talking, a white figure of a young man, about 16 I would say, appeared in the doorway to the tiny kitchen. Just his head and shoulders and he looked as if he was going to speak but then got the facial expression of what's the use, they can't hear me sort of thing. The young man faded away and I said, I see a ghost over by the kitchen. The other elders said, shut up, you're just trying to scare us. But my companion said, no, I saw something too, like a cloud. I could see the young man's face clearly and the impression I got was that he was a surfer who died in the ocean perhaps. We lived a hundred feet from the ocean and surfing was illegal there but many did it anyway because in the winter the waves were absolutely huge and there were many great white sharks there as well because of a seal island not far away. Now, the last event on my mission was that I hit a chunk on broken concrete with my 10 speed and went over the handlebars and fell into oncoming traffic. I then felt lifted up by my armpits and pulled back three feet. I looked around but nobody was there, just cars all around me. My companion was already a half a block away, pumping his bike pedals furiously, taking no notice of me. No pedestrians were around anywhere to be seen and a car ran over my front tire of my bike just as I was being pulled back. Had I not been pulled back three feet, the car would have run over my upper body at least and perhaps my head. That wasn't the first time nor the last that unseen hands saved me from death or great bodily injury. But I left my mission disillusioned with missions, mission presidents and even some missionaries. I thought that it would be an inspiring adventure but it turned out to be a very boring sort of door-to-door -door sales job. Like trying to sell yellow snow to Eskimos as I said before. The other missionaries were looking for numbers, I guess, to impress their family and wards, home congregations, and the mission president, the man in charge of the missionaries. I was looking for seekers of truth, though, and was shocked to only find one, a good man who just could not join the church because, well, he smoked. All of our other investigators, people we tried to convert to the church, they were not seekers of the truth, but listened to us because they wanted to marry a good-looking Mormon woman, or because they thought the church could help them out financially, etc. It was all very disappointing, disillusioning, but I did have those paranormal experiences. I eventually resigned from the Mormon church and became the follower of a miracle-working prophet from Lebanon at one point. Those are all days gone by now, but... I'll never forget my experiences from when I was a Mormon. I have never truly believed in the supernatural. I thought that it could be possible I guess so I stayed the heck away from like Ouija boards and the like but my opinion changed after I had my own personal ghost encounter. I was renting a room in Thailand and I had been there for a month with no strange occurrences. However, on my second to last day, I woke up and something was off. I felt a, a distinct presence, I guess. I knew someone was in my room and that he was male. I sat up in bed and I saw a man standing in front of my door. The door was closed behind him. At first I thought it was my next door neighbor had come into my room, but as I tried looking at him, he had no distinctive features. I'm really not sure how to explain it, but it was like I could only see him with my peripheral vision. Any detail I tried to focus on was fuzzy and unclear. That's when the panic began to set in because I realized I was not seeing a live human. I kept thinking that it would go away if I just kept blinking. So I'm sitting in bed blinking over and over like a maniac and this thing is just not disappearing. After about 10 seconds of this, I reach for my glass to try and get a clearer look. When I look back to the door, there was nothing. To be clear, I was scared, but I never felt threatened per se. It was just their sort of thing. I was so convinced I must have had a full-blown hallucination, I just went about my normal day. 
My host called me later in the day to invite me to the market with her visiting family and I casually said, for sure. Also, I think I saw a ghost this morning. She responds, did you actually? Come downstairs right now. So I went to her place downstairs and she was hanging out with her family. This is when she drops the bomb that her house is haunted. She said that she doesn't advertise it because obviously it would hurt her business, but guests have occasionally seen him over the years. Apparently, both her mother and sister also saw signs of the ghost in the hours before me, a toy car moving by itself and the sound of a boy laughing in the house. She shared that he is the ghost of a young boy and that he is allegedly the protector of the house. She showed me his shrine and it was covered in things that a little boy would enjoy. She said that they were discussing how I was going to be leaving the night before and she thinks he visited to say goodbye perhaps. She also said that I should buy a small treat to leave at this shrine to say thank you and I did all that and flew home the next day. Here's the thing though, I didn't see a boy, I saw a man. I didn't feel a child's presence, I felt the presence of a man. So was the ghost boy and the sightings by her family just a strange coincidence and I just straight up hallucinated? It felt so real though. I've never had any sort of hallucinations prior or since that encounter. I've never had sleep paralysis before and that morning I wasn't paralyzed or anything. This whole experience has shifted my worldview and sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm just going crazy. I'm looking for an explanation, I guess, supernatural or otherwise, for what I witnessed. I've lived here for 10 years now and there have been things that have happened that have driven me to find answers about it and even at times beg my husband to leave. I often hear disembodied voices, so compellingly I think someone is in my house, so I go meet them, only to find that there's nobody there. For a while, my front door would open and close by itself. It's a heavy door, made of steel and glass, and there's no way that it could swing open by itself and slam shut. The knob has become a little stuck over the years and we often have to try multiple ways of opening it now. I even started dousing to try and find if there were any higher energy fields in my house. I've read so many books to try to explain the sense of anxiety that I get here as well, from fairies to telluric currents. My pendant showed me a path that goes from a hill outside my house, through my house, out the other side and down the creek. After asking it to show me the door that it comes through, I came into my living room from working one day to see the door had been put up in search on my TV, which honestly, I have no idea how that happened. Just yesterday, I noticed a handful of little white pills on my coffee table. I have no idea what they are and how they got there and neither does my husband. There were probably 10 or so just sort of lined up in a row with no suggestion of how they got there or who put them there in the first place. I've spent 10 years now trying to figure this out and I haven't even gotten into everything that I've experienced here. If anyone has any ideas or suggestions, I would genuinely love to hear them because, like I said, this whole thing has me absolutely freaked out and I just want to get out of here. A while ago, I was a young and foolish hardcore atheist type who would basically just give it to anyone talking about ghosts or aliens or anything out there, I guess you could say. My worldview was extremely narrow and didn't have much interest in anything outside of going to the pub with my mates. Now, I want to share with you guys the experience which forced me to completely 180 from that old, annoying character into someone who fully believes, no, not believes, but knows the existence of the spiritual world. I was living with my ex-girlfriend, 
and on her street was a big house on the corner. The property was surrounded by a high fence, but there was a little gate in the middle where you could sort of get a glimpse of the well-kept garden that was there. An old woman who lived alone there and could often be seen pottering around in her garden, who most of her time outdoors would be spent behind the little gate between the fences. We'd see her there all the time, chatting with neighbours or just having a nosy up the street. I never really spoke to her myself, but I did see her there a lot. Now one night at around 10.30, I was pulling up on the street outside of my girlfriend's house after going to see my mate. It was dark, I had literally nothing on my mind, and really wasn't thinking about anything. I parked the car and I proceeded to get out of the door. The house on the corner with the gate was just in front of my parking spot. As I closed my car door and I start to lock it, I noticed a bright light coming from that gate. And that was when I look and see a full apparition of this old woman. It was her, but it was like a foggy, translucent figure of her, giving off a pretty big amount of white light. The fence was even illuminated by the light that she was radiating. She turned and looked at me, and as soon as we faced each other, she shifted behind the fence. It wasn't like somebody stepping aside though. It was like she sort of drifted sideways, as if floating. Being who I was, I instantly tried to dismiss it, convincing myself that I just imagined it. I went into my girlfriend's house and said, You're going to think that I'm crazy, but I'm sure I just saw a ghost or something at that old woman's house. My girlfriend replied, You do know she died two days ago, don't you? At that... I froze. Her words were horrifying because they confirmed what I saw. I started freaking out, kind of funny now that I look back on it all. I remember my eyes were just sort of streaming and I was just sort of in shock I guess. I kept replaying what I just saw over and over in my mind. It just hit me like a truck. I needed that experience badly and it changed me and led me on a, a whole journey of, well, if ghosts are real, what else is there? And I've since discovered a ton about this strange realm that I would have never learned if not for that experience. I really don't care if anyone believes me or not. I wouldn't have believed me either if not for seeing it with my own eyes. We can entertain ghost stories or even choose to believe them, I suppose, but... You can't really know them until you've definitely seen it for yourself. I personally have never really shared this, though my wife and girlfriend loves to share this story with anybody who will listen. Years ago, when we first met, my wife and I shared a love of photography and exploration we called it ghost hunting at the time, but it was more akin to visiting abandoned locations and just taking photographs. I used a 35mm camera with Ilford HP5 Plus film and she used a Canon Rebel digital camera. We would often scout locations online with plans to visit them and get some pics for our library. This time it was an old abandoned fuel refinery or storage depot just off of a beach overlooking Lake Ontario. It would be tricky getting into the old refinery itself from the front, and so I used Google Maps to see if there was any other way that we could get in. It looked like a wall was blocking most of our way in, except for a small section just off of the beach that had only had a chain link fence there. The beach itself looked extremely disheveled, like it had seen little use, so we hoped that this would give us the privacy that we needed to sneak in. I mean, sneaking into an abandoned industrial structure isn't exactly legal, but we didn't want anyone calling the cops on us or whatever. So we packed our gear and we headed out on our excursion. We had a hard time finding the entrance to the beach parking lot, but we found that it was blocked only by a loose chain that lay on the ground, half buried in the dirt as if someone had removed it long ago and just sort of left it there. As we pulled into the parking area, there were no cars except for ours, which we noticed immediately. As we pull in and I park, my wife points out and says, there's people here. I look up and see several dozen people all along the shoreline. 
and all staring out at the water at literally nothing. No ships, no planes, no boats of any kind. They were all just sort of staring blankly. There was nothing particularly interesting about these people. They were all different age groups from young adults to elderly. Though there were no children and all were dressed as you'd expect people to dress. What I mean is that it was a warm sunny day and though some were in shorts, I found it odd that others were in long pants with jackets. It was far too warm for a jacket. What really struck me though was the confusion of how they got there. I mean, there were no cars, no bikes, nothing. And no place to park up on the street for, I would say, at least a few kilometers. No houses nearby either, so no chance of locals. No houses nearby either, so perhaps they were locals? Maybe, but from where? Anyway, they're pretty much ignoring us as we sit in the car, contemplating whether to call the whole thing off, partially because of our need for privacy and partly because of how weird it was feeling. After a few minutes of deliberation, we decided to continue on with the plan, though, thinking that whatever they were doing, they're not really interested in us, it seems. So we got out of the car, grabbing our cameras... And no sooner do we close and lock our doors, when every one of their heads turns to look at us. I mean, every one of them, and there's a couple of dozen of them. Still facing the water with their body, but their heads turn to look at our direction. We sort of froze for a second, looked at each other, just completely weirded out. It felt like a long time, but was probably only a minute or so when... They all just turned back to face the water, ignoring us again, but all at the exact same time. At this point, we got together and in whispers were discussing what to do. All the while, we were watching these people who were now completely ignoring us. Finally though, after some back and forth, we decided to press on in the end. Honestly, we'd been to some far sketchier places in the past, though this was definitely a new one for sure. We walked along the beach to the section of the wall where the fence was and found a gap to enter it. This is when I noticed that they were looking at us again, every single one of them. We paused at this and hesitated to enter. After a few minutes, they again turned away, so trying to be sneaky, we ducked behind the wall to the fence. And from where we were, I couldn't see all of them, but the half dozen or so that I did see... They had again turned their heads toward us, not moving their bodies, just their heads. It just seemed that every time that we moved, that's when they would look at us as well. We were sort of committed at this point though, and so we decided to get in, take our picks, and then quickly get out. Now, the time that we spent in the refinery, it couldn't have been more than 15 minutes. We'd planned for an hour or more originally, but... The strangest being what it was, we knew that this one had to be a short one. As we climbed back through the gap in the fence, the first thing that caught me was that there was nobody in sight. As we climbed back through the gap in the fence, the first thing that caught me was that suddenly there was nobody in sight. I stopped my wife and told her this as we hesitated before passing the wall. We looked out slowly, trying not to call attention to ourselves. As we passed the wall, the entire beach was in view, and there was not a single person there. Nobody. Even stranger, though, was that it looked like nobody had been there at all, at least for a long time. Now, I certainly didn't make any close inspection of the area, but the sand looked undisturbed, there were some footprints, but not enough for several dozen people, and they didn't look new by any means. You know how a beach of sand can look sort of dry on the surface, but if you kick it, darker wet sand underneath shows? Well, there was none of that. Just a few small dunes of dry, blown sand around. It was really, really eerie. The only noise were the distant cars on the road, and after this... We just hurried back to our car, not running really, but definitely not taking the time to enjoy a day at the beach. 
Not that there was much to enjoy there anyway. But we will never forget that place and how truly freaky all of that was. This story is of some of the first memories that I have. It takes place in a house in Ostel. There's no real order to these as they happened over 30 years ago now. Since these though, I have never had another experience again. To be honest, I sort of wish I had though. So I had a toy record player that was plastic. It played thick plastic records and one day while I was playing with it, sound just started coming out of the speaker. I don't remember what it was. It didn't last long. I tried to get it to do it again, but nothing. That night, I would hear dishes clank together when everybody was asleep. But the way my bed was in my room, I could see down the hallway and... One night, while laying there, I saw a skeleton peek around the corner and wave at me. Another night, I was sleeping on my stomach and... I felt a, a hand or a claw down my back. Not hard enough to be painful, but definitely enough to wake me up. The next morning, I asked my parents if they had been in my room or not, and both of them said no. These things didn't really scare me, I guess, as I wasn't really old enough to understand what was going on. But the next things, they definitely did scare me, and are 100% as I remember them. So I awoke one night to my bed moving, shifting around, levitating even. I heard two male voices talking. I quietly said, hey, and one of the voices said, shut up, kid. I promptly did just that, and I hid under my covers until I woke up the next day, which is the theme for the next two as well. My mother was sitting on the side of my bed. She was wearing a towel around her body, and... One around her head while she had just gotten out of the shower. We were praying at the time and she laid me down to go to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep and it was at this time that she just sort of faded away. I screamed for her as loud as I could. She came running out of my sister's room into my doorway. Behind her soldiers in full uniform came running out as well. I hid and my screaming seemed to have not been heard by anyone like I was in a bubble at the time. The only one that heard anything was my mother who came running. The final story is when I went to my parents' room to climb in between them one night, that they were both very much asleep, and after laying there for a few minutes, I hear a voice. Hey kid. I look at the foot of the bed and there's this ventriloquist doll, Charlie McCarthy, just sort of... I don't know, like standing there or floating maybe. Mind you, I didn't know that this was him until much later. But he asked me what my name was, what my parents' names were. And after that, I got too scared and I hid under the covers. I once wrote the people who lived in this house a while back, asking if they had anything happen to them and unfortunately, I never got a response. But... Those are my experiences, and to this day, I swear by them that they are true. I've decided to share my story because it's something that has stuck with me, and I've never heard a similar experience from anyone else. For context, too, I grew up in a very haunted farmhouse. My family saw and heard things as well. So, I was around 10 years old and I was upstairs playing with a little bouncy ball at some stage. I bounced it and it went behind a big dresser so I went over to grab it naturally. Now, there was a smaller dresser next to it that was full of my dad's old comic books and when I leaned over to grab the ball, a slender white hand came out of the drawer and grabbed onto my wrist. Obviously, I freaked out and tried pulling away then the hand gripped tighter so I started screaming. My brother came running up the stairs and as soon as he reached the top, the hand let go and disappeared back into the drawer. He didn't see it unfortunately, but he believed me because of, well, just how shaken up I was. I'm curious though if anyone else has experienced anything like this. It's not the only thing that happened to me there, but it was definitely one of the scariest. 
I still think about it a lot. This happened back in 2017 and I still remember it like it was yesterday. I was in my bedroom laying on my bed. The way the bed is positioned you can sort of see out into the living room seeing the TV. My door was open at the time as well and it was about one in the morning. Now the living room television turned on by itself to its loudest volume and it startled me a lot. I didn't think too much of it because I assumed it was my stepdad because he enjoys playing pranks on me all the time. So I waited it out until he would come out laughing or do some sort of a jump scare, but in the end, he never did. In fact, he came out of his bedroom asking why the TV was on and why it was so loud. Quite honestly, I thought that he was joking, but he was really serious and had a sort of groggy look on his face. So he turns it off and we go back to sleep eventually. The next morning, I asked my dad why the TV went off like that, and he claims that it was the connection to the satellite, and it was nothing to worry about. His explanation, though, just, it never really sat right with me at all, because, first off, that just doesn't make any sense. We don't have a satellite. We had Xfinity at the time, and that television, it didn't have cable, just my dad's room. I asked him again, and... This time he tells me in a soft and serious tone, don't tell your stepdad that it was a ghost or he's going to freak out and be terrified. Just say that it was the satellite and move on. I did just that as to not cause a commotion, but man, I was absolutely terrified now. Mostly because a few days later, it happened again, this time in my room. I had just turned my TV off after gaming for a few hours when not even a minute later, my TV turns on by itself and to make it worse, the TV in the living room turned on too at the same time. That was downright terrifying. I also honestly don't remember what I did after that. Maybe the anxiety is just blocking it all out, but I'll never forget that experience. With the TVs both unexplainably coming on like that simultaneously again. This didn't happen to me, but to my dad. I walked into the kitchen to get a glass of water, and my dad walks into the room, asking me if I'd use the bathroom in my parents' bedroom. I tell him no, and that I've been in my room the whole time. I could tell, though, that something was wrong when I saw the look of fear on his face. He told me that somebody was in the bathroom, and it wasn't my mum or my brother because they're asleep, apparently. I asked him what he was talking about. He told me that he was going to use the bathroom but heard loud noises so he stood by the door which was open but didn't walk in because he didn't understand what was going on. He said that he thought that for whatever reason someone was using the toilet with the door open so he continued to wait by the door sort of confused but then he said that he realized that it sounded like something different and that it was too loud to be someone using the toilet, and that it sounded like someone was vomiting into the toilet because he heard splashing. Then he said that he heard the sound of a man gagging and clearing his throat. So he gets concerned and peeks into the bathroom, but nothing. The noises were gone and nobody was there. He said that he knew what he heard was real and that it was so real that he had to check behind the bathroom door just to make sure that no one had broke in. And then he checked the shower and he said that his jaw dropped because he saw soapy water and dirt all over the floor of the shower. He then says that he doesn't know how to explain what happened and to be honest, neither do I. If anyone knows what this is about or has any other logical explanations, then I would genuinely love to hear it. I'm really not quite sure how to start this, so I'm just going to say it. I have some sort of uh, an entity in my house that is getting more and more active, and I really don't know how to get it to stop. The lights in my bathroom flicker, even when I screw them in more. Lights in my bedroom have turned on and off by themselves, at the switch, mind you. I often see something in my peripheral. 
Whenever I look at it, it disappears, but it seems like it's wearing some kind of black robe, and I feel or hear three gentle taps on my temple every now and then, usually when I'm trying to fall asleep. It's unsettling having this much activity lately, since the activity had previously declined. A little bit of background. I live at home with my family. I'm in my childhood bedroom in the basement. When I was a teenager, I was really stupid. And at one point, 2018 if I had to guess, me and my friends held a seance with a Ouija board in my room. We had contact with something that called itself Jason. It told us things that we knew were lies, like that it died in this house, no previous owners mind you, and stuff like that. We said goodbye and thought that that was the end of it, kept the Ouija board in the hall closet. After that, there would be random cold spots in my room though, like you would be sweating from the space heater until you sat on the bed and it would be super cold. There was also a really uneasy feeling in the hall where the closet was. Then at some point, maybe 2021 I think, I started seeing this thing. It was like it used to be a woman, but there was black instead of a mouth and eyes, and it was smiling literally from ear to ear. I would always pretend that I didn't see it, walk past and go about my business. I eventually told my friends in 2023 about that creepy thing and explained how it was next to the Ouija board. We eventually made a plan to bury the board. I took the board to her place, she gave me some sage, and... I tried to light it over the Ouija board, but the spring in the lighter shot straight out, leaving the lighter completely useless. I did get another lighter and lit it away from the board and cleansed the board. Then we talked about where to bury it. It was around this point that we saw a very young kid standing in the street just sort of staring at us. We went to see where his parents were, but as soon as we walked his way, he just ran we watched him go into a house that my friend thought was abandoned. And my friend swears that he was a demon, but I think that she was just being paranoid. In any case, we left the board on the sidewalk to go and get some lunch because we were really stupid. And when we came back, you guessed it, it was gone. I figured at the time that since the board was out of my possession that I was safe. So I went home and cleansed my area very thoroughly. I stopped seeing that terrifying apparition, so I figured all was well, even though I still couldn't shake the being watched feeling. There are a lot of antiques in my home, so I figured that it's possible that something from one of those was watching. A lot of people who don't know about the Ouija incident have said that they feel like they're being watched or something isn't right in my room. I would just ignore it because it was just bugging me too much and I cleansed my room. Just an eerie feeling and a, a light flicker here and there. Seemed harmless enough to be honest. But now, it's getting ridiculous. I'm having trouble sleeping because I'm seeing something moving around my bed and I wake up several times around 3 or 4 in the morning. And so my question for all of you guys is, what do I do? Any knowledge or advice or similar stories are greatly appreciated because, quite honestly... I'm just out of ideas. I'm going to cut to the chase and say that I don't believe in the supernatural. In fact, I've only ever had one unexplainable experience in my life and I'm still trying to this day find a reasonable explanation for it. This story, it's been stuck in my head since I was a kid and... I start to tear up whenever I think about it. This was in the first house that I remember living in. I'm pretty sure that we were the first people living there as well, and it certainly wasn't old enough for someone to have died in it. I remember as a kid that I would regularly hear voices calling my name. The voices didn't sound like anyone that I know, but I would also see huge opaque shadows that would very quickly move across the hallway occasionally. And if this was all there was to it, I would just assume that this was a hallucination caused by a family history of mental illness or something like that. But I very vividly remember my aunt and cousins visiting our house and I told one of my cousins, I believe that she was 13 at the time, about the weird shadows and how they would call my name. I showed her the hallway that this would take place in 
and eventually, one of the shadows appeared and moved across the hallway while she was there with me. She jumped a little bit and just said, whoa, in that kind of tone that you would use when talking to a dog that's jumping on you. I remember hearing the voice and asking my cousin if she heard it too, but she said that she didn't. But nevertheless, she was super creeped out by the shadow. Neither of my parents, nor my sibling, remember this happening, but I remember it so vividly and it was such a frequent occurrence that, honestly, I don't think that it could have been just a, a nightmare or a hallucination. So this one time, I was at Walmart with my dad. But this wasn't a large Walmart. It was one of those neighborhood grocery store or smaller versions. I believe I was about eight or nine and I'm now in my thirties. We were grocery shopping like any other night. On this particular night, my dad and I were walking towards the exit after checking out when suddenly my dad realized that he forgot the toilet paper. He hadn't exited the store quite yet and we're right outside of the bathroom or drinking fountains, which from what I have seen are typically placed in the same general location in most Walmarts. And my dad said, wait right here by the basket buddy and I'll be right back. This wasn't unusual since I was allowed to go and grab things that I needed on my own like shampoo and whatnot, and I knew to be on my guard at all times. Now, it couldn't have been more than two minutes that I found myself being approached by a man. To be honest, I really can't remember much else other than the fact that he was a man and was a lot older than me. I really can't remember his face or height or what he was wearing. The rest is pretty much a total blur, but this man came up to me and said, Hey, I remember looking up at the man as I gripped the handles of the basket. I have puppies in my car, he said. I've also got candy. You know, the whole spiel all of our parents warned us about. The man began to wave me toward him and reached his hand out, as though he would place it on my shoulder. I held onto the basket handle as tight as I could, and in that exact moment, I heard my dad shout, Hey! It was almost an actual roar as well. The man, he reacted instantly and moved so quickly through the exit doors that it almost looked like he evaporated. My dad, he grabbed me and was likely putting together the pieces faster than my little brain was processing the whole thing. Since nothing actually came of this though, I can't say for sure what the man's motives were. Regardless though, my dad will always be my hero and I'll never forget the lesson I learned that day about the importance of being aware of your surroundings at all times, no matter how often you have been somewhere or how comfortable you may feel there. I was a 20 year old college student and my friend and I were living and working near her college for the summer. A guy that she worked with, he invited us to a party at his place. The two of us went along with three other friends. We turned out to be the only females at that party. There were at least twice as many guys there. After drinking and playing a few drinking games, people started to leave. A large group of guys was invited to another party and left to go there. Then our three other friends decided to go too. It was down to the host, my roommate, and two other guys. For some reason, maybe we ran out of alcohol, I can't remember, we decided to go to this other party. Now at this stage, I had had a few drinks, but not enough that I was seriously impaired or anything. My roommate though was pretty tipsy by this point. She was walking with her friend from work, and the other two guys who had been talking to me at the party were walking close to me and talking to me. At one point, my friend and her co-worker were walking far enough from us to be out of earshot. The two guys told me that they knew of a shortcut and tried to get me to follow them down a, a dark alleyway. I told them that I wanted to stick with the group. They tried to persist for a few minutes, but I was adamant that I did not want to be separated from my roommate. Somehow, mysteriously too, we never actually found the party. The details are a bit fuzzy, but I think they couldn't find the exact location or something. This was the mid-90s, so no one had a cell phone to call or a text to confirm a location or anything. My roommate 
told her co-worker that she wanted to walk around to find another party because she wasn't ready to go home yet. There were lots of people out and often you would run into someone who would invite you somewhere. I told her that I just wanted to go home at this point. I was pretty desperate to get away from those guys actually. My roommate was feeling good though and just was not having it. The two guys started to whisper to one another at this point and I was able to hear some of what they were saying. One said, no, you didn't hear what she said. They live with four guys. This was true as well. We had four male roommates, which at some point had come up in the conversation earlier. This immediately set off more alarm bells. I continued to argue with my friend and eventually she realized that we weren't going to find another party. The two creepy guys left and her co-worker walked us home. On the way home, I told them that I wanted to leave because those guys were scaring me and why. If this were to happen today, I would have called those guys out in front of everyone and I would have made more of a scene, I guess. I'm just thankful that I still had enough awareness to not go down that alleyway with those guys. Because if I had, I really don't know if I would still be here. I don't consider myself a, a true believer, I guess, but because of my personal experiences, I do have a hard time completely discounting the idea of otherworldly beings interacting on our plane of existence. I've suffered from insomnia and sleep paralysis and the strangest dreams and nightmares. I'm a super light sleeper. I've always been scared of the dark and am 100% the type that turns lights off and sprints to my bed. My sleep paralysis is pretty typical, I guess. I'll wake up and feel this darkness and pressure and panic. I don't automatically realize that that's what it is. I'll usually think it's some sort of dark presence with malice attacking me at the time. I'll try to scream at it, banish it away like I've seen in the movies, etc. But when I come out of it, I can recognize that it's just sleep paralysis. That being said... There are other things that have happened revolving around my sleep that I can't rightly explain. There are a few instances that I can recall, but at the forefront of my mind was the experience at my grandfather's house. So I lived with my grandfather for almost a year at one point. For almost the entire time, everything was normal. But one night, as I was sleeping, I felt something touch my foot. It's so typical, right? Scary movie, but I swear that I felt something wrap around my ankle. I had a toddler and there was a cat in the house too, so I figured that it was just one of them on my leg. I'm not big on being touched while I sleep though, so I got a bit angry and shook it off. And that was when I felt my foot connect with something solid, kicking it, and I heard it hit the ground. And what happened next struck me with absolute terror. An ungodly yowl. Not like an angry cat, but like some sort of demon. I immediately sat up and saw some human-like woman crawling back and forth on the ground, looking extremely agitated. I scooted back against the headboard, looked at the window, and then back at the floor, but by that point, it was gone. When I checked the time... I saw that it was around 4 in the morning. I couldn't leave the bed before the sun came up because, quite honestly, I was just way too scared to. When I spoke to my grandfather about it, he let me know that his mother-in-law used to live in that room and died of dementia. He said that she's apparently haunting the house and was probably the woman that I saw based on my description. I didn't get along with her daughter, so I guess it kind of makes sense that she would want to scare me off. But it makes me sick even thinking about it now. Anyway, this stuff is really hard to talk about, but it's reassuring to know that others have had random scary experiences like mine too. I'll come back at some point and share more about the experiences that I had another time, but for now, thanks for listening. When I was a teenager, 
Me and my friends, we used to quite frequently go to abandoned buildings of different sorts. This hobby kind of got worn out for me personally, but when I was at my first or second year of university, I noticed a, a weird, not too big, abandoned building very close to my uni. My uni is located pretty much downtown. The place that we are talking about is very crowded and filled with elite property, stores, and historical buildings. So it was sort of weird seeing the building just standing there in some sort of a yard between other buildings. And so I grabbed my friends, there were four of us, and we decided to check it out. We came there late at night so there would not be more eyes than necessary. It was also winter. We grabbed our tools and broke a lock to one of the entrances, but it was a dead-endish sort of small room. It was pretty creepy with a wheelchair standing there. We then found another door though to the building. It was locked more heavily this time. We couldn't break the lock itself, so we somehow managed to make a big hole in the door so that everyone could just climb in there. It was very loud, obviously, so after we had done it, we decided to wait a bit before going in, just in case someone called the cops on us. After an hour spent at the nearby McDonald's, we proudly, with how we handled that super locked door that seemed to haven't been opened for years, decided to go in. The building felt empty and damaged. There wasn't really much stuff there besides concrete walls and a lot of trash, which we thought was old. There was no light in there at all. Every window was locked too. It's sort of creepy to think back on this decision, but the first thing that we decided to do is to go to the attic, all of us. It was pretty much more of the same though. A lot of trash, some graffiti, and generally nothing too interesting. Then we decided to come back to the floor that we started from and check it out properly. And while we were there, for some reason... I guess being kind of creeped out from the atmosphere, just standing in the corridor, which allowed to overview two big halls, both of them were filled with trash. One of us decided to go across the hall. We could see him clearly with a flashlight to check out some sort of shack that was located in those piles of trash in the end of the hall. He looked inside and then rushed back to us very concerned. He said that there was apparently a body inside. We all thought that it was a dead person at first because the building was locked and I mean there was no way that there was someone living in there somehow. We honestly felt like someone died and nobody seemed to care. This discussion could not be continued though because we then actually saw someone coming at us, a mere silhouette at first but we lost our minds from this and we rushed into the door hole which was not perfect for anyone to climb through it in such a rush but while we were making it out this person shouted something angry at us with a rather unsettling voice and was mad at us for breaking the door. We were terrified because of just how unexpected that was. We honestly believed that there could not have been anyone in a locked abandoned building like that that was out of use for years and partially damaged. I guess we just never thought to ourselves that maybe it was not the city that locked it, but someone managed to privatize the locks. The guy himself was creepy too, living in absolute darkness like that, full of trash in an abandoned private hospital. Living in absolute darkness like that, full of trash in an abandoned private hospital. Afterwards, we tried to find out what that trash was, but... It was the best guess that it was just trash. In the end, we got away and nobody was harmed, which we were thankful for, but it was a, a real wake-up call to be much more careful about doing this. So I'm currently staying in some friend's garage made into a temporary apartment until I get back on my feet. Right off the bat of moving in, I got weird vibes in it too. For the first couple of weeks, I kept having intense nightmares that were partially sleep paralysis where someone or something is in the garage with me, hiding in the corners watching me, then slithering around and peeking at me from below the side of my bed, or something coming up behind me and grabbing me. One specific window in the garage creeps me out the most though. It's not covered with anything, so if anyone was outside, they could just look in. 
and I can't see out due to the lights that I have on inside. My cat will often sit in the window and scratch at it as if she's trying to get out to something outside, which is weird for her because she's freaked out by being outside, is a bit of a big wimpy indoor pampered baby, so the only conclusion that I have is that there's something out there that she's trying to get at. One day a couple of weeks ago, I was listening to music on my headphones. I had my laptop open, had nothing but the main screen on it. I was dancing around vibing to the music when I suddenly heard a weird deep sound somewhere in the garage with me when the song that I had on was ending and I could slightly hear my surroundings again. I turned around and on my laptop the screen was suddenly jumbled and glitchy looking and then started showing or flashing these weird symbols that didn't look familiar at all. I ripped my headphones off and this terrifying sound was playing from my laptop, like this deep demonic voice that sounded like it was speaking backwards was playing. It was honestly the scariest thing that I've ever heard in my life and I love spooky stuff but this was like the type of evil voice that I've heard only in absolute worst nightmares. It sort of resembled the song Masked Ball from the Eyes Wide Shut soundtrack if you've heard it, but way deeper and more evil and creepy sounding. The strange glitchy symbols kept flashing and changing on the screen while this weird backwards voice was speaking through my laptop. I tried to shut it off or hit escape, but nothing was working. So I finally slammed it shut and immediately had a really bad panic attack. I ran inside to my friend's house and I told them what had happened while I had an absolute meltdown. I made them go back into the garage with me and inspect the laptop and the plugins and everything so we could try to explain why it happened. But in the end, we couldn't find an answer. What's even weirder though is that we all noticed that my laptop was actually still on mute from when I muted it like a couple of days earlier, making it even more strange that I was hearing this coming from my laptop speakers. I mean, it just should not have been possible, like at all. I still have no idea what happened or why. I would love to chalk it up to some weird technological glitch, but there's just no way. There was absolutely nothing happening on my laptop at all and it was muted. I don't have schizophrenia and I'm not crazy or anything. Like, I swear on my life that this happened as well and it wasn't a hallucination or something. I really wish that I had a logical explanation for it too because it would ease my mind a bit. It messed me up pretty bad for a while though and the night after it happened... I spent hours just outside smoking cigarettes, staring at the garage from afar, terrified to even go in and sleep. I still have regular nightmares and sleep paralysis of something being in there with me, but to be honest, I really don't want to count on that as paranormal or anything. So, I guess my question for all of you guys is, does anyone know how or why my laptop would suddenly start flashing glitchy symbols and a backwards demonic voice would start speaking through the muted speakers like that. If you have an answer, then please do let me know because, like I said, it would ease my mind considerably. So I started meditating about five years ago. I had done it before, but not as deep as I was going. I don't know if it was the technique or what, but the method that I was doing was training me to go longer and longer without a single thought. It was simply sit down and feel your body. That was it. If you have a thought, let it go and focus on the feeling of your body. So longer and longer I would go without a thought over the coming months. I did this for sleep. I've always had insomnia since I was in middle school and it worked. I was finally beginning to get to sleep on my own. I usually had to take an OTC sleeping pill. But something started to happen the longer that this would go on. Over time, as I would meditate, I would start to hear sounds. The TV would start clicking, almost as if it would if it was cold and then got hot. 
Same with the knocks in the walls. The knocks would sound like an old house readjusting to different temperatures. That's what the sounds sounded like anyway. No big deal, right? Just a click in the TV or a creak in the walls. But the more I meditated, day after day, the more these sounds would pick up in activity and I noticed that I wasn't hearing them when I wasn't meditating. Maybe once a day I would hear the sounds, so the sounds seemed to be related to my meditations themselves. But I kept meditating. I mean, it was weird, but it wasn't anything distressing. But as the days went by, I would put myself into such a deep state that when I heard a sound, I would jump out of my state real quick like you would if somebody jump scared you. And they seemed to be getting louder now too. It was around this time that a new phenomenon started happening as well. I started having involuntary movements, I guess you could call them. Now, when I was in that state of no thought, I had sound activity picking up to jump scare me and now my arms and legs would randomly jerk. And again, it seemed to only happen when I meditated. At first, the involuntary movement was light, but as time would go on, my arms, legs, and even head would jerk more and more violently. And the weird thing was that all of this stuff would affect my meditation and immediately take me out of a state that I had cultivated myself. But I kept meditating daily, and the next thing that started happening was I would start to realize the knocks on the wall weren't the only sounds that I was hearing. I was also hearing furniture moving in the other room. Now, this activity was not only happening when I meditated, but all the time when I was alone in my house. It got so bad one day that I was taking a shower and I thought that I heard someone break into my house. It honestly sounded like somebody had kicked my front door open. Obviously, I get out of the shower to look, but nothing. It got to the point where I was hearing all of these noises all the time that I couldn't tell if somebody else was in the house or not. Worst of all, the scariest part was that it would also pick up its activity when I would read. What I mean is that it would make a noise the exact time when I would get into the book, effectively preventing me from being able to read. It felt extremely creepy, like there was a, a ghost deliberately tormenting me that was able to tell when my mind would get into any sort of state like this. It felt like a, a conscious entity that was sent to torment me and prevent me from going any further or any deeper into a meditative state. It also seemed to purposefully try to make me feel like somebody was in the house when I was alone. There was also an incident where I heard this super strange noise in the middle of the living room and my cat jumped almost out of her skin. She was so spooked. And that confirmed to me that it wasn't all in my head. Now, this activity never happened when I had somebody else in the house with me. This caused me so much despair and distress that I began to drink as alcohol was the only thing that made it seem to stop in the end. And... It's been five years since all of that. I'm now sober for a month and the first time being sober since this happened, when I started drinking because of all of this, I began to drink every night so that I could sleep and at least have a couple of hours every day to be free from the torment. But I'm ready to start practicing spirituality again and meditating, but I have to know what all of that activity and torment was all about. What it was, what caused it and how to prevent it going forward. So please, this is real and the scariest part about all of this is that most people think it's not. I experienced something that should be impossible so I had no clue who to talk about it to or how to solve it. I was very alone and trapped with this thing that really just shouldn't exist according to, well, science and everything but if you have any idea about what I should do then do let me know because... I want to move forward with my life and I want to just have this all over and done with. My aunt and uncle's house was in a small desert town. They had about four acres of land and a good amount of space between neighbors. 
On the back of their property, there was a fenced-in area with a large shed and an old salvaged U-Haul moving truck. I was visiting for a couple of weeks one summer. My little cousin and I were about 10 or 12 at the time. And one morning, we were roaming the property by ourselves. The adults were all out running errands. We ended up walking between the fence and the old moving truck. We were on the passenger side of the truck, walking from the back towards the front, when all of a sudden, my cousin just froze. The hairs on the back of my neck stood instantly. He didn't make a noise and just pointed at the side mirror. In the reflection, we could see a man sitting in the driver's seat. His face was caked in dirt and blood. He was moving around quickly, and at one point he ducked out of our view. But we instantly turned and sprinted back to the house. We locked all the doors and called the cops and family. We were freaking out, obviously, running from room to room, looking out the windows, brandishing baseball bats, you name it. The police and family showed up after about 15 to 20 minutes. They searched all over, but they never found the man. They found the fence was bent down where he must have climbed over it. There was blood and dirt smeared all over the driver's seat of the truck. He must have been trying to steal it because the ignition wires were pulled out like he was trying to hotwire it. No explanation for the blood and nothing happened after that. My cousin and I had nightmares for the next few nights just thinking about it but that was really about it. The obvious bit is that he was a guy that was trying to steal the car but why he was caked in blood like that? No one still has any idea as to why that was the case. One of my mum's friends rented an apartment, but she was away at college, so she allowed my mum and another one of her friends to live there while she was gone. My mum and this other friend lived in the upstairs apartment along with my mum's one-year-old baby, my older brother. My mum was a teen mum, so would have been about 17 years old. The kitchen walls were made of tin, so it was always freezing cold. They always felt uncomfortable around that side of the apartment too. There were some strange things that they just couldn't explain. Like, one time they saw their college friend's room looked like it was on fire. It was all lit up really strange and was glowing unlike any light would create. They would hear footsteps coming up the stairs to the house and called the police five or six times to check the apartment police would come, check the apartment, and never really found anything. My mum and her friend began to suspect that it was a ghost, so they would read the Bible out loud, which made the footsteps stop so they could finally get some sleep. But one night, my mum's friend called her brother, who happened to be a sheriff in a nearby town. Her brother brought a buddy over, and they came over to check the apartment following one of those episodes of footsteps. And they found that the ex-boyfriend of the friend who was living at college had been living in the attic the whole time. They think that he'd been climbing a tree into their college friend's bedroom and getting up into the attic from her closet. My mum somewhat knew this guy and she had met him before and knew who he was. But they were just acquaintances because apparently he reacted inappropriately in social situations and was hard to connect with. After my mum had moved out of the apartment and into a new one, he once came to visit my mum's new house along with the college friend. After he had left, my mum had discovered that while he was over at her house, he had rearranged my brother's furniture in really strange ways. Everything from his bed to his toy box was completely changed. Several years later, he apparently murdered an old lady by shoving her down some stairs in a shopping cart and it was discovered that he had schizophrenia. So, he'd been living in that attic for the entire six months that my mum had lived there. It's possible that he had been watching them, my brother as well, but they wouldn't have known the information since they never saw him. He had an entire room set up in the attic too. My mum also believes that the house also had some kind of spirit there because of the freezing rooms, uneasy feelings, biblical words having an impact, and the unexplainable situations like the glowing room. She also says that their downstairs neighbor had children who she hated and never wanted to raise. 
She would often neglect the kids and lock them in their bedrooms from the outside, so it's possible the entire house just had some residual negative energy from all of the absolute shenanigans. Who really knows? Thankfully, after that, the whole situation just sort of sorted itself out, which my mum was very thankful for. But it is creepy to think about someone like that just living in your house and you're completely unaware that they're there. My house has always been a, a hotspot for strange things. They've been happening for 19 years now. A few family members died in the house when I was like two or three, and me and my mum have seen multiple apparitions. The earliest event that I remember was when my uncle came to visit when I was like 10. He's a diehard skeptic, taking every possible opportunity to explain away any possible event. While I was watching Ghost Adventures with my grandmother, he walked into the room talking about how it was unrealistic and obviously fake. My grandmother asked him why and he said because ghosts don't exist. He then walked over to the dinner table and a bulb from the light over the table just exploded. He had just replaced all the bulbs a couple of hours earlier too and there were three other bulbs that were completely fine. It was only the bulb closest to his head, which was weird. Another time, my sister had a nightmare, so I was laying on her bed next to her, comforting her. A couple of hours later, I saw a woman walk down the hallway, stop at the door, lock eyes with me, then turn and walk into the bathroom next to the room. Now, usually I would be able to see the light turn on, or at least see the light from under the door, especially at 3am, but I didn't. I asked my family the next day if they went to the bathroom by my room and they didn't. It isn't the primary bathroom since they have one in their room and one in a hall closer to the family room downstairs as well. So it would be strange of anyone to walk to the second floor to use my bathroom when there are two bathrooms much closer to everybody else. But the next one happens once every two or three years. So, the first time it happened, I was 14 during the summer, before my freshman year of high school. I had been staying up late and sleeping in, as one typically does during the summers. I remember watching Lilo and Stitch and seeing the shadow of a small child standing outside of my door. When I cautiously said hello, it just ran off. I remember a chill running down my spine and every part of my being telling me not to follow it. I've always had strong intuition, so I listened, and I just continued watching my movie. An hour or so later, I heard a loud bang. I called out to see if one of my family members dropped something, receiving no response, and against my better judgment, I walked downstairs to their rooms, but they were all asleep. Since I was downstairs, I took the opportunity to grab some snacks, and standing at the back corner of the kitchen was that same little boy. I flipped the light on, seeing him just disappear. At that, I booked it out of that kitchen, leaving the light on and going back upstairs. The next morning, and by morning I mean at around 2pm, I was making some eggs and my dad asked if I had scratched my leg or something. I said no, and I looked at my leg to see what he was talking about. And on the back of my leg... There was a long scratch with a bit of dried blood around it. It spanned about 12 centimeters just above my ankle, running pretty much vertically at a bit of an angle. It was at that that we saged and salted the house that night. We repeated that too whenever I would see it. It came back last month at about 4am while I was watching Hamilton. I grabbed the jar of salt and my obsidian and evil eye necklace from my closet and drew a line of salt in front of my door and on my windowsill. I saged the house again the next morning and that was that. I know this must sound weird to other people, but honestly, when you've lived with something like this for years, I guess it's just something that you eventually get used to. So my sisters and I have years of stories from this one kid that we babysat for over the years. 
The first event happened when the kid, his name was Liam, was maybe three or four years old. I was cooking for him in the basement. It was an old house, a former estate from the late 1800s, so the kitchen was in the basement, designed for the servants with a dumb waiter, etc. I heard some movement upstairs though, like people had let themselves in and were having a conversation and setting things down. The parents weren't supposed to be back for like another few hours. Not a big deal though. The voices didn't sound threatening, like women laughing and chatting. So I asked Liam if there's a maid or cleaning service that ever stops by, thinking that the parents may have forgotten to mention it. He then casually replies, no, we hear voices sometimes, but mummy and daddy say not to talk about it. I checked. No one was upstairs and the front door was closed. But there was also the time that he went into a sudden trance while repeating some guy's name over and over after fixating on an old painting and was rolling around on the floor for a minute with the whites of his eyes showing, then snapped out of it and had no memory or was confused why I seemed so panicked and worried about him. I later told his parents thinking that it's an obvious health issue or was a possible seizure or whatever, but they just sort of chuckled and said that they would mention it to their therapist. That and the reoccurring night terrors that Liam would always have if he slept in one particular room. It happened a couple of times to him, once to his friend, but in both cases it was a sort of sudden blood-curdling scream coming from the kid in the room. I remember racing upstairs to find his friend once as she was hyperventilating, upright in bed and just kept repeating, there was a man in the room, there was a man in the room. Liam also was a sleepwalker. When he did sleepwalk with me, it also started with a blood-curdling scream and him sprinting down the stairs to find me, seeming terrified but still definitely asleep and not aware of his surroundings, mumbling about a man. I was able to guide him back to bed without waking him while still calming him down in his sleepwalk state. I felt guilty telling the kids that it was just a bad dream or a nightmare when I believed that they did see something, but... I just didn't know what else to do or say. And there are many other stories over the course of 10 plus years between me and my sisters working with this family as their go-to house or babysitter. But then the usual lights and electronics turning on or off suddenly, objects falling off of shelves inexplicably when no one is in the room, doors slamming shut and locking by themselves. My sister swears that she saw a woman walk through the room out of the corner of her eye once, before the TV turned on in the next room. Liam also has an early phase of frequently referencing the dead people. My friend, who used to also babysit for them, refused to even be in the house after the kids went to sleep because she hated it so much. She'd tell Liam that she'd be on the front porch if he needed anything, then would sit outside and read a book until the parents returned. Even if it was freezing, she preferred it to being in the house as the only awake person at night. It didn't help too that the house was like a mile down a dirt road, in the woods past a swamp and old overgrown tennis courts, with coyotes howling in the distance even. The property also had no cell service and the house landlines were usually dead. The house was exclusively decorated with antiques and creepy sort of sexual art and taxidermied critters. The parents also reminded me of a couple out of Eyes Wise Shut and seemed, I'm pretty sure, were into occult practices. There's a famous hippie New Age Center in my town that they were involved in. Oh, and uh, the infamous Alistair Crowley himself used to hang out on the estate back in the day apparently. And there's even a documented story about him performing rituals on the edge of the estate. I learned about this history years after we stopped babysitting for them, obviously. So, overall, it was a, a really scary home to babysit in. But they paid well, especially when they'd come home drunk at like four in the morning. They'd just hand us a wad of cash or sometimes would forget that they paid and pay again on the next day even. And the kid, well, he was sweet when he wasn't saying creepy things. So in the end... I would say that it was worth it. I was on vacation with my family when I was about 14. I was in the pool which had a bar attached and I was casually talking to this group of British people. 
I want to say that it was all guys, but I think that I remember a girl with them. Anyway, I started drinking a bit with them. The legal drinking age was 18, but the people who I was drinking with gave me an extra wristband that they had because apparently they were leaving the resort that day and wanted to give it to someone anyway. My parents didn't know about this, obviously, and neither of them knew that I was drinking. But they were clearly a lot older than me and kept putting drink after drink in my hand. And I was ecstatic because I was, well, getting drunk in a pool in Cancun and out of sight from my mother. They started to try to convince me that one of the guys in the group was 15 and that I should talk to him because he liked me. But even then I knew that he definitely wasn't 15. He also wasn't as old as the others who seemed to be in their late 30s. In hindsight, I'm thinking mid to late 20s. I was young though and just thought that they were joking around with me. But they kept telling me that he liked me and I should go hang out with him. I laughed it off the first time, but they kept suggesting. Keep in mind this whole time my dad was in the same pool talking to his friend and he had his eyes on me for almost the whole time. My parents are very strict. He didn't know what I was drinking was alcoholic and the pool was big enough that you couldn't hear what was being said. At that point, I was totally wasted though and my first time actually getting seriously drunk like that. I don't even remember leaving the pool with this guy trying to tell me that he was 15, but apparently I was stupid enough to do this because I remember thinking that he was cute. But the resort is huge, mind you, and I don't know how I don't remember walking through the whole thing and not remembering it. I often wonder what we actually spoke about. But the next thing that I do remember is walking and approaching a bus stop that was maybe a 10 minute walk from the resort. I know it was 10 minutes because my family and I often went to this bus stop to explore Cancun. He told me that I had a nice body and asked if I had ever had sex before. I just started laughing and he sat on the bus bench and pulled me onto his lap at this point. My world is spinning so I don't protest even though I remember thinking that I wanted to be back at the pool. It was then too that something absolutely beautiful happened. I threw up all over him. Remember, I'm on his lap at this point, so it was like right in his face and on his chest and everything. And I just kept throwing up too, like the exorcist level projectile vomiting. He was extremely grossed out by this and I don't remember what was said, but we ended up walking back to the resort and I never saw him again. I do remember feeling really embarrassed though, which is ridiculous in hindsight. I wobbled back to the pool area covered in throw up where my mum had called the police and her and my dad were freaking out. My mum's piercing voice sobered me up a bit because I remember these parts a lot clearer even though they're still a little bit hazy. But they saw how drunk I was and demanded to know what had happened so I told them. Then they got furious. My mum was adamant on finding that guy or his friends who had all disappeared from the pool at this point. I didn't really see what the big deal was back then and why she wanted to find them. To this day I think about what would have happened though if I hadn't thrown up like that and actually left with this guy. I was 5'2 and 14 years old and he was at least a foot taller than me and definitely not a minor. I remember when he was close to me with no one around and even in my extremely drunk state, I started to get a bit nervous. My parents, they took me to our hotel room and I spent hours in the bathtub just throwing up. My mom was furious, like completely livid. I wasn't too surprised at that because she yelled at me over trivial things all the time anyway. So was my dad though, which surprised me because... He's always so easygoing and honestly probably would have been a bit amused at me being drunk, throwing up. Not in a cruel way, but because I was learning a lesson about alcohol that we all eventually do, right? He actually straight up told me that at some point too before this whole vacation. But now I know that his anger wasn't directed towards me. He was cursing about that guy. I was still throwing up in the bathtub and they had both went into the kitchen area to talk away from me but I could vaguely hear my dad cursing terribly while speaking to my mum in our native language, and I was actually scared by this. I couldn't quite focus on his voice because 
I was legitimately drifting in and out of consciousness at that point. But I remember getting less scared and more just sad, I guess, because I felt like I had disappointed him. He never got mad like that towards me, but then again, I realized later that he wasn't actually angry at me. And he wasn't angry at the drinking either. He was angry at that scumbag. I do remember wondering why they were making such a big deal about it all. And it was only a few years later that I actually understood. Later on that day, because this all happened at like 2 in the afternoon, so I was at least cognizant by dinner time. I expected my mum to blow up at me over dinner when I was sober, as she usually does. That woman's like a life fuse, let me tell you, but... They were both just kind of quiet and staring at me and didn't leave my side after that. I can't imagine what they were going through, knowing about the danger that I had been in just a few hours before this, staring at me like it was a miracle that I was even there anymore. I was young and stupid, but I would like to give my deep thanks and gratitude to Beer for constantly annoying my stomach to the point of projectile vomiting. Without it, I honestly don't even know if I'd be here. So I grew up in San Antonio, but my father's side of the family are from Jordanton, Pleasanton and Christine areas, about 30 miles south of San Antonio, and my mother's side of the family are from El Paso, West Texas area. They have some stories from being around these areas, but here's a few of them from my family. So my father grew up in the Pleasanton, Christine areas of Texas, which is about 20 to 30 miles south of San Antonio in the Texas brush country. The Texas brush country is a huge part of South Texas. It's not necessarily desert, but kind of a medium between the oak tree or cedar tree forests of the Texas hill country and the almost desert landscape of northern Mexico. Miles of wide open ranch land with loads of thorn and mesquite trees, with some oak trees sprinkled in for good measure. Growing up, we'd go down and visit family members in that region, and when the sun would go down, I always felt creeped out by the area. There are some creeks there too that make you swear that you're in Louisiana swamps, with large trees hanging over the creek beds, covered in Spanish moss and giving the areas a very creepy vibe, especially at night. It's well known too that there are now lots of wild Chile Pequin plants along lots of rivers and creeks in this area because when Santa Ana's army were making their way to San Antonio before the Battle of Alamo, the soldiers had with them Chile Pequin peppers to make salsa and add spiciness to their foods when they would make camp. And naturally, lots of the soldiers would drop excrement along the creeks and the seeds of the peppers would find their way into the soil and begin sprouting the pepper plants. Anyway, one of my father's uncles claims that he saw a large winged humanoid bird with glowing eyes swoop down on he and one of his buddies while out at the lake known as Choke Canyon, fishing for catfish late into the night from the bank without a boat. The story goes that it was around 11pm or so on a Friday night and my father's uncle Robert and his buddy Chester, the two men had decided to go fishing for catfish and drink some beers and enjoy the start of the weekend with a nice relaxing nighttime fishing trip to the lake which was about 30 miles from the town that they lived. So Robert, having worked in construction and having worked that entire day, was feeling pretty sleepy and decided to nap in the truck while Chester stayed on the lake bank, listening to the radio and watching their fishing rods that were casted out into the water. Uncle Robert climbs into the driver's seat of his truck and falls asleep pretty much instantaneously. An hour or so goes by and he's rudely awoken by Chester, who is screaming and pounding his fist on the passenger side of the truck, yelling like a madman for Robert to unlock the door to let him into the truck cabin. Robert unlocks the door and asks Chester, who is out of breath and panicking, what the heck is going on. Chester, clearly panicked and freaking out, says to start the truck up and for them to get the heck out of there. He said that he was chilling in his folding chair and had just caught a small catfish and had thrown it back into the water, had sat back down in his folding chair when he heard what sounded like a large bird flapping its wings behind him. He stood up and turned around and there was a, a bird-like humanoid 
kind of like a large crane-like bird with a human face and beak-like mouth with glowing red eyes and a massive wingspan, something like 12 to 15 foot wingspan. He turned around and sees this thing flapping just behind and above him and appeared to be readying to land right where Chester was sitting. So at that, he legged it. These two were born and bred South Texan country boys, like my father, and had grown up in the brush country hunting birds, bobcats, alligators at that same lake, fishing and being common rural kids. So they had a lifetime of experiences with wildlife in that region and had never seen anything like it. Robert starts up the truck and in the rearview mirror, illuminated in the red glow of the brake lights, Robert also sees the large bird-like creature land behind the truck and begin walking around the truck over to the passenger side. And just like it had been relayed to him, it was shaped like a man-sized crane with thin long legs that looked like it would stand at eye level with an average height man. And it was the creepiest thing that he had ever seen. That was when Robert knew that Chester wasn't screwing around and he throws the truck into gear and just peels out of there. They end up getting back to Robert's place and Chester and he both decide to spend the night together, shotguns in hand, until morning, which is when they decide what to do next. They ended up going back the following day, armed to the tooth to retrieve their fishing poles, folding chairs, and other fishing gear, and found the footprints of the whatever it was that they saw, still fresh and in the sand around their fishing spot. This happened in the 70s, so it was before smartphones with cameras. When my father told me this story, I pictured something like a, a tall shoe bill, I guess, but there's really nothing like that in this part of the state. Maybe he just wanted to eat the fish that Chester had just caught. Following the incident, they would end up eventually going back to fish in the evenings, but they would always be sure to take firearms for protection from that point on. This next story happened to my great-grandparents on my father's mother's side. So they lived on their small cattle and livestock ranch in Christine, Texas for the last later decades of their lives. Christine is a super small town where everyone knows everyone and there's really no need to lock your doors when you leave or when you go to bed. My great-grandparents were the warmest people that you would ever meet. Always smiling, sharing humorous stories with friends and family. They'd take your coats or jackets when you'd enter their warm home and before hanging them up on their coat rack, they'd sneak a $20 bill into your pocket for you to find later. They were the kind of older couple who were always poking harmless jokes at each other in front of company to entertain you. Super charming and loving and always smiling and loving the life that they'd built for themselves. Visiting them was always a treat too because I grew up in the city and when we would visit on the weekend, my great-grandfather would take my younger brother and I around the ranch to see the animals and livestock, pet the horses, feed the goats and throw rocks into the stock pond. When we'd return to their house from seeing the ranch, my great-grandmother would have our favorite breakfast for dinner on the table. Fresh hash browns, farm-raised bacon and ham, homemade tortillas, mild and spicy salsas, and fried eggs. Oh, and coffee. Always with coffee, even if it was dinner time. And we loved it. Anyway, this story takes place during the 1960s. Not exactly sure on the year, but my great-grandparents were in their late 50s, and their children, my grandmother, were all grown up and had gotten married and moved out at this point. It was just the two of them living on the ranch. So, they were on their way home from visiting some family in the south side of San Antonio, about 70 miles away. They had lost track of time, so it was pretty late in the evening when they left. And they're driving back home to their ranch near Christine, Texas. And on their route, they have to drive over this wooden bridge that extends over a deep creek. I think sometime in the 1980s, a better road was paved into that town that no longer made it necessary to have to take this small dirt road and bridge from the Highway 16 to their small ranch. In fact, several years ago, the wooden bridge was torn down and a new bridge was built using steel and concrete. Spanish moss now hangs from the trees, which really makes it creepy. 
and from what I remember, this bridge is about 80 feet long from end to end. Due to the creek, it extends over being relatively wide as well. Underneath the bridge is a good 30 to 40 foot drop down to the creek bed. And for the most part, the creek is dry year round and really only sees water flow during rainstorms. But as my great grandparents are driving over this wooden bridge, their truck suddenly dies and comes to a stop near the middle of the bridge. My great grandfather starts swearing up a storm because he's tired. It's late and they're still about 10 miles from home. He maintains his truck better than most and they had a full tank of gas. Even the headlights and the cabin lights shut off so they were stuck there with only the moon bathing them and their surroundings in the soft moonlight. My great grandfather was born in the brush country of South Texas so there's not much that he hasn't seen out there. And in this situation, while most people might be a little bit intimidated to leave the safety of their vehicle, my great-grandfather was in his element out at night in what is essentially his backyard. Thinking that it has to be a battery connection that has come loose, my great-grandfather asks great-grandmother to hang tight, pops the hood and opens his door, stepping out into the cool night to check under the hood and hope to diagnose the issue. As he's struggling to see, fumbling with the battery connections under the hood, behind him, he hears the sound of clip-clops on the wooden bridge. It sounded like steps of a hoofed animal approaching him from behind. He turns around and lets his eyes adjust to the dim moonlight to see what's making that noise. Maybe it's a deer or a cow or a goat that has gotten loose from one of the other ranches in the area. Squinting, he looks down the bridge and sees what appears to be a, a very thin man, about five and a half feet tall, but with a set of very large ram horns on his head, walking upright, approaching him from the opposite end of the bridge. Its hoofed feet clip-clopping on the wooden bridge, that was what was making the sound, as it's steadily trotting towards him. A cold chill ran up my great-grandfather's spine and he quickly shut the truck hood and hops back into the driver's seat, slamming shut the door behind him and locking it. My great-grandmother, confused by his sudden reactions, asks what's going on and my great-grandfather points at the humanoid that is now slowly approaching their vehicle. She sees it and reacts with, what the heck is that, a goat? and they sat there, watching it approach them and their vehicle. They can now see that the horns on its head are very large, much larger than any ram or goat that they've ever seen, but still cannot make out whether it was a ram or a goat's head or a, a human's head. It was about 20 feet from the front of their truck when it hunches over and begins walking on all fours of its cloven feet. They can only vaguely make out its features as it reaches their vehicle and begins circling them. My great-grandparents twisting and turning in their seats to watch it as it's bobbing its head up and down, pacing around their truck. It doesn't ever touch their truck. It only sort of slowly saunters around their vehicle with the only sound in the night being its hooves clipping and clomping on the wooden bridge. And though it was dark and difficult to make out its exact features... They both agreed that it had the body of a bony, skinny man, but with the head of a goat. They both said that the creepiest part of the encounter was watching its large horns bobble around the front and rear of their truck, unsure if it was going to do anything to them, and how it felt like an evil or demonic entity, that they could sense it not being a normal animal, but a creature with evil intent, it seemed. They hold their breath and don't know what to do, and my great-grandmother, being very Catholic, begins praying quietly under her breath. On its fifth or sixth time walking around their truck, it stands back up on its hind legs and meanders towards the opposite end of the bridge from which it came, eventually disappearing into the black night and leaving them in the truck, frightened and shaken. Weirdly too, a moment later, like clockwork, power is restored to their vehicle and my great-grandfather starts the truck up and peels out of there quickly making a beeline for their home where they rush into the house and grab firearms and they spend the rest of the night locking all their doors and windows and they didn't get any sleep. 
When we were younger, my cousins and I would go and visit what we believed is the same bridge. I'm not sure if it was the actual bridge where this apparently took place, but it was very similar. And we would park our truck out there, get out and thrill ourselves by walking around out there after dark with flashlights and embrace the creepy ambience, armed with shotguns and rifles, of course. My great-grandparents, they never saw anything like that creature again. But from that night onward, my great-grandfather always kept a loaded shotgun and a pistol in his truck with him. He never left without one, in fact. Now, this final one, my father, who was working as a construction contractor, had a work crew leave a job site in a panicked frenzy once because they apparently saw a Bigfoot-like creature in the creek behind the house that they were working on. It happened at a house that they were building a two-story garage at in the hill country, a little bit north of Spring Branch, Texas. I think it was around 1998. I was around nine years old. My brother was six at that time. The house that they were working on was on a piece of land way out between Blanco and Spring Branch. My father told us the work crew called him from a payphone at a gas station in Boulevard around noon and told him that they weren't going back to the job site until the following day because they were just too frightened. And also if it would be okay for them to bring some rifles and shotguns to keep in their trucks on that project until they were done. Mind you, they were a no-nonsense group of Mexican laborers, hard-working guys who would be at the job site from like 8am until sundown, busting their butts in the hot sun to earn a decent paycheck. But apparently, around lunchtime, after the crew had eaten and were resting in their trucks and in the shade of some of the trees, one of the guys went down to the creek behind the house to take a pee and explore the property a bit until it was time for them to get back to work. Behind the house was a sort of sloped wooded area that led down to a nice little shallow creek. And it was here where he said that he saw what he thought was a big brown bear peeking around a tree at him. Naturally, he got a bit spooked and startled, slowly backpedaling to the house up the hill, trying his best not to make any sudden movements and to not take his eyes off of this bear. As he was making his way back up the steep hill to the house job site to where the rest of the guys were, the bear ran from behind the tree and darted across the creek and into the woods on the other side. That was when the worker got a clear look at it and saw that it wasn't a bear. It ran upright on two legs and had the build of a large man covered in dark fur. When he saw it run and realized that it wasn't a bear, that's when he broke into a frenzied run to the rest of the guys, screaming at them to get into the trucks and for them to leave. They were a little thrown off by him, but he jumped into his truck and peeled off. And the rest of them, they saw how scared he was, and so they quickly followed him in their own two trucks. For a bit of background, I live in an area known as the Greater Cincinnati Area. We're technically in Kentucky, but if you were to go to your local airport and buy a ticket to fly into Cincinnati, you'd land closer to my house than Ohio. It's a fairly socio-economically diverse area too, with a lot of history connected to the Civil War and history connected to various native tribes like the Iroquois, Cherokee, and Shawnee, but I don't think that there were ever heavy population centers here. Mostly the land south of the river was used as hunting land, I think. Now, I have a number of personal paranormal stories from living here, and there are a number of well-known paranormal locations within this range. Bobby Mackey's, Waverly Hills, Maysville Slave House, etc. But the story that I'm writing about today has me perplexed. Maybe because I have not experienced it firsthand, and neither have any of the adults that I've spoken to. Now, if you're the type of person who's willing to dismiss this based on the ages of the witnesses, I can't blame you. I'm guilty of it from time to time as well, but hear me out. Teenagers, being the only witnesses, are actually part of what has me telling this story, and could be a part of something bigger going on. But what I've learned is that, as adults, we need to be able to read the kids around us. They're poker players without the time to perfect their bluffs, I guess. And what I wrote off at first became 
more alarming as I grew more familiar with these kids and started to recognize their normal personalities and their tells. So, on to the story now. My son met some kids at a new school who lived in a local trailer park. Not a stereotypical one, it's actually a nice one going off its looks. After getting to know them at school, he started wanting to hang out at their houses. The trailer park has a basketball park, a play park, and a system of streets that offer ample ability for kids to play in the street without worrying about the traffic flow. Not to mention having plenty of open fields the kids use for various sports and games. Safe to say, my son loved the idea of hanging out in this trailer park. After a while, we became regular fixtures there. Him more so than me. I was just the ride, really. He hung out there. I would even get to the point that I would take some of my son's friends on trips, just so that he could have experiences with his friends that weren't confined to this one area. Life experiences and a constant attempt at maintaining balance is a big part of my parenting style. And it was then that I started hearing these stories, though. At first, I would only hear them as the kids exchanged the stories with one another while in my car, but after a while, I became the cool dad, probably because of the trips, and I would be occasionally included in their conversations, and I ended up getting the full rundown of what was going on in this trailer park. In addition to all of the features that I mentioned before, this park also has a small wooded area that occupies about an acre of land between two trailers in one of the bends in the road and thins out to only a few feet as it extends about a quarter of a mile behind the trailers running along that road. This is on the road closest to the interstate, so I've always assumed the wooded area was left to help dampen the noise coming from it. One of my son's best friends, the only kid he's still allowed to associate with. His name was Kevin, lives in one of the two trailers that flank this wooded area, a fact that comes into play later. So as you can probably imagine, the kids will venture into this area to explore it. And this is where the oddities start to happen. I've been told stories of dark figures standing at a distance, featureless entities that vanish before these kids' eyes. I've heard of stories of sounds coming from this area, everything from growls to wails, and even various forms of mimicry. Different stories have it sounding like a friend, a parent, unknown little girl, baby, etc. Almost always beckoning the kid to come into the wooded area. Some of them have even shown me red marks and scratches that they've gotten, oddly enough as well, usually on what one could say is the weak link of the group that ventured into the woods on a given occasion. Starting mostly with the physically weaker kid, but also if a kid goes into the woods whilst under some sort of emotional distress as well. They call it a skinwalker, but I'm guessing that that's just because it's the creature of the moment for the time. Originally, I was hearing these stories from a single group of kids, a fairly large group, but still one you could figure would be able to get their story straight. But over time, the group fell out of friendship. Certain members took issues with other members and went from friends to enemies. All a bunch of teenage drama, really, that I would have preferred to avoid. But it's an odd situation when I had to be there to drive my son. Hearing all of this when I did drive him afforded me the ability to give my son some life lessons, and that part was cool. Some of these issues didn't involve my son directly though, so he would still consider both sides of a conflict a friend, and I would hear each talk about the wooded area with the same levels of fear and mystery as they had when they were hanging out every day, which is what started me looking at this with a real curiosity. Up until this point, I had viewed it as a just an urban legend type of thing, something that they may have believed, but was only born of collective imagination. But as I started considering everything around this place, Kevin told me a story about having seen the same type of tall, dark, featureless figure in the corner of his room. That really was a moment when I had a weird series of connections that were made in my mind. I started looking at everything that I knew about the place from my conversations with parents and other adults who lived there. There seemed to be a, I don't know, like a, a constant flow of darkness through that place. Brand new cars would require major repairs. Relationships that had spanned years without major issues would end badly shortly after moving into the trailer park. 
The people, specifically children, would become overly aggressive towards other people, even if it hadn't been in their character. Accidents resulting in injury grew more frequent, and it even reached the point where a 17-year-old ended up stabbing a man over an issue with a small pet dog. Ultimately, that's why I'm sharing this too. That last part was all I or any other adult had seen. That seeming decaying of the society within the bounds of this random trailer park. But with the stories that I've heard and the ways that I've heard them, I've come to believe that something resides within that wooded area, unable to affect anything outside of those lines, never presenting itself in a way that quantifies it as something with which I'm familiar but something that seems to cause a blanket of negativity to soak into the very lives of anyone that lives there. And so my question for you is, does anyone have any idea of what this type of thing could be? I can't think of anything that fits every issue that I've been told, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some of the high strangeness things that I've been told. It's late here and I'm starting to get tired, so I'll end here, but if you have some information then... I would genuinely like to hear it. My parents have told this story to me numerous times throughout my life, and both of them and my older brother corroborate this story in exact detail. They seem genuinely terrified of what happened, and they've told very few people about this experience. So... In the summer of 1990, my mom, 31, dad, 35, and brother, 15, attended an Aerosmith concert in Ohio. After the concert, the three of them were walking to the parking lot in a huge crowd of people. My parents were standing on one side of the street about to step off the curb when they saw two hooded figures across the street. By the time their foot hit the pavement, the figures were directly in front of them. They also seemed to float without feet and moved from one side of the street to the other in an instant. The next thing that they knew, they are standing alone, not in the exact same place that they were, with their arms outstretched from the elbow, palms facing up, and their hands and forearms are tingling. They made their way back to the car, and when they did, nobody else was around anymore. The parking lot was empty, except for their car, obviously. My brother was sitting on the bumper waiting for them and said that he had been waiting for them for about two hours. My parents have no recollection of what happened during that two hour period. My brother says that he was walking and he turned around and they were just gone. He went back to the car and waited. Two weeks after this incident, my mum finds out that she is pregnant with me and they believe that this may be the reason that they were approached. I personally have never experienced anything unexplainable like this, but I do believe their story. I've never known them to make things up, and they're not psychotic or anything. They believe this encounter was some kind of extraterrestrial being. I believe their experience was genuine, but I'm not certain that aliens are the explanation, but I'm also not ruling it out. This happened in a post-concert crowd with hundreds of people around, mind you, and I'm wondering if anyone else has had a similar experience or any insight on what could have happened to them. For those of you who may be thinking that they were dosed, I agree that this is a strong possibility, but I'm not aware of any drug that can cause this. For those who may be thinking about a DNA test, I did ancestry and there wasn't anything crazy in the results. I've also had MRIs before and I have normal human anatomy. I don't think my mum got pregnant during this incident. She was already pregnant and just didn't know it yet, I guess. Anyway, it's a weird story, I know, but like I said, if you have any light to shed on it, then please do let me know. I'm a woman in my 30s caring for my elderly parents, so staying in a downstairs room in my childhood home at the moment. The window faces the main street, which is an average residential street in a fairly quiet area. The bed faces the window. I often leave the window open at night since I need it to be cool to sleep, and I haven't really worried too much about it, 
since there's a cabinet with an aquarium in front of the window area, not blocking the window from view, but I can reach to open and close it pretty quickly. But it would make it difficult for someone to climb in as well. My dog, Sable, also always sleeps in my room with me. But while she's a sweet-natured, medium-sized dog, who doesn't look the least bit threatening, she is a fantastic guard dog in that she's always alert to any noises and will stand her ground and bark and growl if she senses a threat. So, with these things in mind, I've never really worried about opening the window and leaving it open. But after tonight, I will not be doing that again. So it started at maybe 3.30 or 4 in the morning sometime. I was awake since I care for my parents like I said. I often have disrupted sleep patterns and I'm awake at odd hours anyway. I was reading a book and I heard Sable growl low and deep. Then she jumped off the bed and began pacing a bit, looking up at the window, before jumping up to the cabinet by the window barking. I shouted, Hey, we're calling the police, dog will bite just in case there was somebody there and went to look out at the curtains to the side, but I didn't see anything. I pulled the curtains closed again and made sure to pull the right curtain over, then drew the left side curtain, the one that covers the open part of the window, all the way over, covering the right side curtain too, tucking it down so any wind wouldn't be able to move it. I wasn't really alarmed then, I mean... It's a fairly quiet residential street, but there are foxes around that we sometimes hear, and occasionally someone passing by our neighbor's gate next door will make Sable growl or bark as well. But she doesn't usually react the way that she did this time. She usually growls, but stays on the bed, and her reaction was much stronger than normal. I thought that even if it was someone scoping out the open window to potentially burgle, they would have seen now that the room was occupied by a person and a dog, and would go find an easier target but mainly I guess that it was just a random noise that she heard outside. I was wrong. It was a good half hour or maybe later after I had relaxed and thought that I might doze off soon that I heard her growl again. It was a really serious deep and low growl again and I listened, again thinking that it might be foxes or something. But this time, I heard what sounded like deep horror movie breathing noises like the heavy breathing sounds a pervert makes down the phone to his stalking victim in a film or something. I sat up, looked up at the window, and my heart stopped. The curtain had been pulled back and lifted at the bottom like someone was peeking under it, and I could still hear the heavy breathing. I shouted hey again and moved from the bed to the side of the window so I could see past the curtain, and saw the figure of a man move away from the window to the right towards the front door and exit of the front garden. It was too dark to make out features or clothing. It was just a dark male figure. Shaking, I immediately thought that since I knew that he'd moved away and wasn't at or under the window, I reached and pulled it shut, grabbed my phone and called the emergency services. But one thing that creeps me out most is that, in hindsight, that would have taken a few seconds for me to move from the bed to the side of the window and that was after I'd shouted and he knew that I'd seen him. But he must have stayed there even knowing that I'd seen. Until I moved the curtain and could see out. Only then did he move away. The heavy breathing also had to be deliberate. Because it was so loud. Like someone trying to frighten me. While on the phone with the police I went around the ground floor of the house turning the lights on. Making sure the rest of the house was still secure and it was. I was very careful to lock the doors and all the other windows at night and everything looked undisturbed. Two patrol officers came shortly before 5am and they took the report. They suggested asking the neighbours if they have camera footage and to let them know of a potential prowler in the area tomorrow as well. And they went to drive around the area saying that they'd be wanting to know what someone was doing wandering around at 5am, the time the police arrived anyway. Since the dark meant that I only saw the shape of a person, I didn't really have a description. I doubt that they can do much. I couldn't even be 100% certain that it was a man if I'm being honest, but the breathing and the figure that I saw instantly made me think male. The outline of his head looked smooth, so either bald or wearing a tight cap. And the height, I would guess would have been average, 5'8 to 5'10. But I'm feeling really shaken by the whole thing, really angry too and violated and wishing that I had installed cameras now. We will be looking into that for sure. I never thought anything like this would happen to me. I don't have any enemies or recent exes. 
no one that I know of harboring any grudges. Since I'm caring for my folks full time now as well, I'm not out socializing or making enemies or anything, nor are my elderly and disabled parents. I'm at the wrong side of 35 and living in jeans and joggers and t-shirts, no makeup or fussing with hair most of the time, so not likely a target for a peeping Tom pervert. And if it wasn't for the fact that it was my dog who alerted me to something both times, I would have wondered whether I was half asleep and just dreamt it, that I had just imagined it. I have had hallucinations once as the result of a bad reaction to an antidepressant, but that was more than a decade ago now, hasn't happened before or since then, and I learned how to test my reality in times I was worried about whether something really happened or not from a psychologist. When I asked how I could ever trust my own senses again after that reaction to the meds, that is. They said that to be sure something was real, to see if other people can see or hear the thing too, or if it's a noise or voice outside, can I see someone or something that explains the noise? If so, then it's probably not a hallucination if both oral and visual perceptions match up. The dog sent someone there first though, and I heard and then saw someone as well. I definitely wasn't dreaming or imagining it. I don't use drugs and almost never drink, I'm scientifically minded and I don't really believe in ghosts and... While I love a good horror film, I'm rarely freaked out by them anymore. Too old and too cynical, I guess. And all that's to say that I have to think that it was someone who was looking to burgle a house. But for the fact that they came back so much later, maybe someone was on drugs or having a mental health episode? Or, and this one probably bothers me the most, someone who wanted to actually scare me. But why and who? How do they know where we live? Are they going to come back? And new fears keep popping up into my head and like most nights I'm up at some point late at night or in the very early hours and will let the dog outside into the back garden for a quick pee and I'm suddenly aware of how easy it would be to attack and gain entry then. There's a passage around the side of the house to go from the front to the back garden with only a small side gate as well, meant to keep the dog confined, not designed to keep others out and it would be easy for someone to access this, then hide against the back of the house, completely hidden from view. Whoever they were though, they were bold enough to come back a second time, even knowing a person and a dog were in that room. Perhaps hoping that I would have fallen asleep by then? They seemed to be trying to deliberately scare me though when they returned the second time, doing that deep breathing noise and staying by the window even after I'd shouted. In those few seconds that it would have taken from me shouting out until I reached the window and could move the curtains and see out, they could have moved and been long out of sight, but they chose to stay there until there was a chance that I could see them, only then moving away. The breathing noises and then the coldness that ran through me when I actually saw a man moving away from the window, that I think is going to haunt me for some time now, along with the question of their motives. Were they trying to scare me? Why? What's to stop them coming back? And if they weren't just trying to scare me, what were they trying to do? So before I start, I just want to say that my father has never been a believer in ghosts, the afterlife, none of it. He lost faith in everything after my grandfather died of cancer. Now, I've played this in my head a million times and... My dad and I have discussed it more than anything else, I think. This happened roughly six months ago. My grandmother had just passed. My father and I, along with the rest of my father's side of the family, were out there to clean out the farm and divide up their belongings and whatnot. Most of the family, they took small things from the kitchen and their old bedrooms. Simple things just to remember them by. So, small talk here and there with my aunts and uncles telling me stories about the things that they were taking... I had a closer relationship with my grandma, but never met my grandpa. Keep in mind that I never met him too. So my dad, along with his older brother and myself, went down to the basement to grab the older poker table that my grandpa had. My uncle went back upstairs to grab a toolbox to take off some stuff off the walls, I think. And it was just my dad and I alone. The basement isn't finished, it's all brick walls, and the only lights are Christmas ones strung up for light due to the ceiling one broke up a few years back. I'm wandering around and I found some shoes in a corner. Without even thinking too, I say, aren't these the shoes that Grandpa was buried in? How did they get here? 
my dad came rushing over, looked at the shoes, well, we looked at each other. He called my uncle to come and look at the shoes too. We go by the steps to meet him and the Christmas lights go out. The lights upstairs go out and then the door to my grandparents' bedroom, which is right next to the basement door on the first floor, slams shut. I turn my phone flashlight on, trying not to lose my mind, run over to where the shoes were, and at that point, they were gone. We ran up the steps, out the front door and into his truck, and we just sat there, not knowing what to say. We both know that those shoes were there, and something or someone is in that house. Neither of us believe that it's my grandpa. I felt like throwing up, and... The whole way home, my dad was complaining of a migraine. I was three years old when my grandpa died, and the only one who would know that those shoes grandpa was buried in was my uncle, who did confirm to my father that what he saw were actually his shoes. So my fiancé and I hiked into some forest in Ontario one time. We had a friend drop us off at the side of an old logging road in the middle of nowhere and we hiked into the woods due east. The road, it ran north-south so basically all we had to do was stay due east hiking in and due west hiking out. And we would reach the road again for our rendezvous at a predetermined time a couple of days later. Now there are no natural predators this far south such as bears or wolves. So for protection, I only really brought a K-bar knife and some bear spray in case coyotes took an interest in our two dogs that accompanied us. The logging road was no longer in use by any industry and we had hiked into the woods a few kilometers so the chances of running into another human were pretty much nil. In addition, hunting is not permitted in this area and there is no water nearby for fishing either. There really wasn't any reason for anyone else to be out there in the middle of the woods that far off the road is what I'm getting at. There's also no cell service, although I did bring a flare gun and multiple flares in case we ran into trouble to signal for help. No GPS, just a compass. We were careful hiking in and didn't do anything risky to avoid injuries in this remote place. It was nearly fall, but it was unseasonably cold that day, but well below freezing. With lots of leaves on the ground and still on the trees, but no snow yet. We set up camp in some thick woods. You could barely see 50 feet away the trees or bushes were so dense. But we were totally isolated and honestly we felt completely safe. It was so cold though and so dark at night, it was moonless and cloudy, that we went to bed early to stay warm. I'm a heavy sleeper too and the next thing that I remember is I'm awakened by my dog pouring at my face pitch black and I can't even see him. I go to pet him but something's wrong. As I touched him I could feel his fur standing straight up and he was completely rigid facing the door of the tent. He was clearly on guard and very alert. At first I assumed that there was a, a woodland creature nearby but I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. That is unusual because I often camp alone no problem and I'm not really easily spooked, I guess you could say. My dog and I just stayed there frozen though and alert for at least a couple of minutes. My fiancé and other dog were still fast asleep next to us. It was 3.30 in the morning. I checked my phone after the incident. The fire was out, no moon, and it was complete darkness. But just as I was letting my guard down, I hear the most unexpected thing... A notification going off on a phone just outside of our tent, maybe 15 to 20 feet away, and I also see a faint glow. I hear a male voice mutter, oh no, or something to that effect, and hear them running through the leaves away from our tent. They were clearly smacking into tree branches too, and swearing as they did so. At this point, they turn on their flashlight as they run, and I can see the beam flailing wildly around in the woods, occasionally back into our tent. The dogs start going absolutely ballistic. I grab my knife and look at my phone. It's 3.30. I screamed out, If you come back here, I'll blow your head off. I'm assuming that he had a satellite phone or really good cell service to get notification like that. The other weird thing, though, was that he fled deeper into the woods and nothingness, not 
towards the west where the logging road was. Well, needless to say, we packed up in the cold and we hiked back to the road that night, watching our backs the entire time. We just walked down the road towards far off civilization until we ran into some other campus set up right next to the road, seven or eight kilometers away from where we came out of the woods. It was just after first light when we made it there. They let us use their satellite phone and we called our friend to come and pick us up a day early. And upon hearing our story, the campers decided that they would pack up as well and get out of the area too. It was a lesson learned and I do not camp in the wilderness anymore without a satellite phone and at least a 12 gauge. I live in what I believe is a house that's built between 1200 years ago to about 600 years ago. It's a cottage completely made from stone, apart from some newer installed pipes, and its original walls and structures were constructed by Viking settlers probably around 500 AD. All of our doors are made of heavy thick wood and I think our house is very likely to be haunted. The first few things that happened while we lived in our house were subtle, yet still noticeable. What I mean is that the house felt uneasy during the day, but it could be brushed off. But in the dark of night, it was almost oppressive. Now, one day, I wasn't home for the night, so my mum was home alone. She told me that she was getting ready to go to sleep at about 12, and she apparently heard footsteps at the top of the stairs, and my bedroom door opening as well. She went to check it out because she thought that it was our dog who had went into our room or something. But the room was empty and absolutely freezing. And my mum told me that she felt really unsafe, which caused her to leave the room and shut the door immediately. When she went back downstairs to the living room, she saw that our dog was asleep on the couch. After this happened, about maybe two years ago... Things have just sort of slowly begun to escalate further as well. Even in the middle of summer or when our central heating is on, my room always feels frigidly cold. Every night I would hear vague banging around the house and very often things would be moved around or changed for instance and many times the vacuum cleaner head had been switched from carpet setting to hard floor setting which neither me or my mum remember doing. But I was always blamed for doing this and it caused a few arguments before as well. But this is when I started hearing at night, whatever it was, slowly climbing the stairs towards my bedroom. It was always very slow, one step every like 5 or 10 minutes, and always ended with a horrible feeling of dread all around the house, especially if it was very dark. I was trying to get to sleep once when this happened. My bed was right beside where my door opened from and I watched as the doorknob twisted and the door swung open. I huddled under my covers for a bit but when I came out for breath I saw a flash of some face hovering over the edge of my bed. Its eyes were dead and its skin was dry and rotten and it had a warped smile as well. It disappeared as fast as it had appeared and it left me almost paralyzed with fear until... I must have just passed out or something because all I remember next was waking up in the morning. Now, this sort of thing happens most nights if I don't have a light on in my room, that is. There's always activity on in the stairs and in the attic, with my attic door being moved open several times in recent years, as well as sometimes groaning or growling in my house too. And the other night, a framed painting had fallen to the floor and then it was destroyed as though someone threw it to the ground and took an axe to it. Though it didn't disturb my dog even and who would have gone crazy, well, logically speaking I would say, but I myself went down and destroyed the painting in that manner as well. I also think that it even follows me around outside of my home now as well, which is terrifying. A few nights ago, I was moving some black bin bags out to the back of the workplace to put them in the dumpster, and there are no lights around there, so it's pitch black. When I was returning from that, I noticed a white face staring at me from behind scaffolding. It was sort of elongated, and it sent a horrible chill down my spine. I only got a single glimpse until I did a double take, but by then it had disappeared. Later, after I had clocked out of work... I took a photo of that place where I saw the face and the next day I took another photo. 
the only difference in the two photos. Two circular lights like beady glowing eyes in the photo that I took in the dark. While in the day, the same lights were nowhere to be seen. As if whatever was there had moved away. I don't know what's going on, but I just have this feeling that something is after me. So, for about three months, I've been experiencing hacking from what I assumed to be another tenant in my building. It began with hacking my Bluetooth speaker. I'd be listening to something while doing housework, and the next thing that I know, my device would be disconnected and the hacker would start playing very creepy and inappropriate music via my speaker. The main song that they would play is Effed With An Anchor by Ailstorm, a song that I had never heard until this. If you choose to listen to the song, you'll see why this immediately freaked me out. I would try everything that I could to turn it off, but they would put the volume at full and play it again and again. This happened on two separate occasions too. After this, I stopped using my Bluetooth speaker to prevent this from happening again, until they hacked into my PlayStation and began playing the same song, again on full volume and continued to play after I tried to press pause or exit my music app. I then unplugged my PlayStation and haven't used it again. Finally yesterday, I had asked Google a question via my Google Nest device and straight after I heard a ding on the device, signaling someone else was controlling it, which is only possible if I grant access, also the case with all the devices that they've hacked so far, straight after the ding, the hacker started playing creepy music again. Different from the last time, but... It was an old song with a very creepy undertone and the only words that I remember are times are getting hard boy and I straight away unplugged my device to stop the music and have stopped using the device altogether. Now the reason that this freaked me out more than the last few times is the fact that I was on the phone with a friend at the time talking about some personal things I had going on. Therefore I believe the hacker is probably able to hear me and I'm unsure whether this is due to them being a direct neighbor of mine or whether they've hacked my devices to listen to me or something. I'm completely stumped with what to do now as I've contacted my landlord and all they said was that they'd send out a warning email to all tenants but I needed to contact my internet provider for further action. I should have mentioned this earlier too but I live in student accommodation and to make it cheaper everyone uses the same Wi-Fi but have separate logins. So the reason that it's easy for them to hack into my devices is due to them using the same Wi-Fi. So I then contacted my internet provider and they said that they can't do anything about it. I really don't know what to do anymore as well. I have now had to forfeit use of three separate devices to ensure that this stops happening, but they continue to find a way to hack me. I feel incredibly unsafe and uneasy in my apartment too. I feel like someone's watching me as well. I'm becoming paranoid that somebody's listening to me at all times and I feel as if I'm just going crazy. I don't know if it's just me as well, but I could have sworn that someone was watching me the other day. So please, if you have any advice for me, then I would love to hear it. So this happened way back in 2017. I, a female and 16, was in 5th grade at the time. Me and my sister, who was female and 19, were sharing a room and we were casually just talking. She was in middle school and I was in elementary. So keep in mind too that I live in a two-story house. The rail that goes along the stairs is like a metal gate so you're able to see to downstairs and all that. At night, you can't see anything when looking downstairs though. It's literally just pitch black as all you can hear is movement. So that night, me and my sister were just hanging out when all of a sudden we hear a deep raspy voice that's coming from the dark and it said my sister's name and we completely froze. Then a couple of seconds later, it said my sister's name again but with more force in its voice and that's when me and her slammed and locked the door quickly. My stomach turned so much and I had such a horrible feeling that I was about to die. I always tell people that it sounded like a clown that lost its voice almost. It was so raspy and scary that it just didn't sound normal. The only people home were my aunt and cousin but 
they were asleep and my mum's boyfriend had just left to work on a car so me and my sister were the only ones awake so we knew someone was inside. It got so silent though all of a sudden and then we could hear the footsteps coming up the stairs. We started to freak out obviously, especially since we didn't have anything to protect ourselves with if something happened. I was on the phone with the 911 dispatcher though while my sister was on the phone with my mum and my mum made me hang up on the dispatcher for whatever reason. Anyway, my mum's boyfriend gets here and there's not a single thing moved. Everything was locked and to this day I truly believe that someone was with us that night. I think about it every day. I truly thought that I was about to die that night. I thought that somebody had broken in and we were about to be killed. But after this, I now believe that this house has a couple of spirits roaming around, but I haven't had anything else happen, so to be honest, I don't know what that was. I had a, a strange encounter with an older man when I was 15. I had just moved to another city and my mother took me and my brothers to the mall. She told me that she would pick us up at one of the entrances at a certain time, so at about 10 minutes before then I sat on a bench waiting with my brothers, phone in my hand waiting on her call. I'm the quiet sort of, I don't know, like laid back type, so I'm really in my own world and not paying attention to the people around me at the time. But even though I'm not directly paying attention to anyone, I still have a pretty good sense in telling when someone or something is out of place. So all of a sudden, I see a tall white man in an old-fashioned dark trench coat standing on the side of me. He's just looking at me with a smirk on his face. I was a young black male from the hood and had never seen someone dressed like him. I looked around to see if anybody else thought that this was strange, but everybody was just minding their own business. He asked if I believed in Jesus Christ. I just looked at him. This was particularly weird because I grew up very religious but had just started to question my faith. He said more stuff related to Jesus and religion but I zoned him out. I was low-key sort of irritated and looked over to my brothers but they seemed to not even notice the man standing in front of me talking. The man still had his weird smile on his face. I got uncomfortable so I looked at my phone to see if I got a text from my mother yet but hadn't. It felt like time stopped as we stared at each other for a few seconds and the man said your mother's outside. I looked towards the entrance but didn't see a truck. I turned back around to him and when I did he was gone. Nowhere in sight. It's like he just straight up disappeared even though there was really nowhere to go. My phone started ringing and it was my mother telling me that she was indeed out front. I looked to the entrance again and see her just now pulling up. I asked my brothers, where did the man that I was talking to go? And they said that they never saw me talking to anybody, especially no one like I described. He reminded me of sort of like the men in black, how they dressed. And when I was young, I thought that maybe he was a time traveler or something, but nowadays... I have no idea what this experience meant and who that person was. This takes a, a lot of strength just to share this because ever since it happened, I just try not to think about it. I think that I have a tendency to downplay my own traumas and experiences and this in particular is something that I just haven't allowed myself to fully process. About a year and a half ago, my mental health was at an all-time low and I was binge drinking regularly in seedy bars by myself. I was 23 at the time and I'm 5'5", 125 pounds, a woman who had no clue what her limits were with alcohol and was doing anything to feel something. An extremely dangerous combination, I know. I was deeply ashamed of my mental health issues and still struggle with telling anyone what I'm going through to this day or even allowing emotions to register fully or come to the surface so that even I know what I'm feeling. And so at the time, this was something that I was struggling with. So I was out past 2am and had been hanging around a group of girls but they had left early without me after a woman had come onto me and kissed me and they realized that I was bisexual. 
It was outright homophobia, but they basically seemed creeped out all of a sudden and a member of the group asked me if I could give them a moment to talk without me and I respected that request and politely left the group and watched as they sort of ditched shortly after. I was already fairly wasted when some guys offered me to come and sit with them at their table and that they would buy me some drinks. I remember stumbling to their table and thanking them and most of what happened after this is honestly a bit of a blur. I remember dancing and making jokes but also being fairly disoriented. I have a, a switch in my brain that can turn on when I'm anxious or threatened and it's as if suddenly all of my anxieties, alarm bells and panicked thoughts just go quiet and only one thing is in my head. I'm in a strange place with strange people and I don't know what's going to happen. I should try and be very nice and just try and get along with them so that they don't get upset or hurt me. They kept handing me drinks, egging me on to drink more and more and even when I started telling them that I felt a little bit sick, they just kept handing me more and pretty soon everything was just absolutely spinning. My phone was nearly dead and I turned it off at 2% trying to keep myself from losing that last bit of battery left for when I desperately needed some way home. Even when it was on, my vision had been so blurry that I could barely use it. I had never felt this drunk before and to be honest, I was getting pretty scared. I started to throw up a bit at that point. I was barely conscious. I can't really even remember the moment that I realized that I might throw up. On the moment, I just sort of was hunched over, feeling weak, and suddenly I just saw vomit hitting the pavement. The guy started saying that they were heading out, and I remember hearing words thrown around like, take care of her, and back at my place. I felt a chill run down my spine, and for a moment my head was just clear enough to ask what might happen if they did that. I somehow mustered the focus and motor skills to clearly say my full address and state that my roommates were home and would take care of me. They just sort of chuckled and didn't really take me seriously. I even remember one of them jeering about it like homegirl didn't even slur, making humor in an almost pitying way that I could still recite my address clearly despite how intoxicated I was. The thought now that they thought that it was funny to see someone begging to be brought home to safety is more than a little sickening, I know. No matter what I said, though, it wasn't a question of if I was going back to one of their places. It was an assertion. At this point, I was feeling so weak and helpless, and I couldn't even really stand up by myself. My head hurt, my body felt like jelly, everything was spinning, and I honestly wondered if I might just die that night. I was going in and out of consciousness, but the next thing that I knew, I was being shoved into a small car. It gets sort of hazy at this point, but I remember the car stopping several times so I could stick my head out of the car and puke and whatnot, and the guy pulling my hair out of my face. It stuck with me that he did it so quickly and instinctually that it was almost like he'd done it so many times before. I remember at one point openly and loudly sobbing that I was scared and I thought that I was going to die. They just kept hushing me though and telling me that I was fine. Everyone in the car was so casual, relaxed and not at all concerned with the, this very, very drunk woman in the back vomiting her guts out every five miles and having a meltdown. The intoxicated person that they had singled out alone at a bar fed drinks long past she felt comfortable with and were now forcingly taking home because she wasn't strong enough to fight them off. But I do remember that they stopped at a Taco Bell and ordered a bunch of things, but I refused to order anything as I knew that I wouldn't be able to keep it down anyway. I was running through scenarios in my head. I knew that they had every intent to act against my will. This was not a benign misunderstanding by any means. I was not supposed to be here and they knew it too. But I was surrounded by four men packed in their car, all definitely bigger and stronger than me, and I deeply feared what would happen if I made some attempt to put a stop to what was happening. On top of this, it was close to 4am and my phone was pretty much dead, and I was too drunk to even stand or walk. If not with them tonight, where would I go? Or what would I do? Lay on the street and puke my guts out until I choked and died or some homeless person found me and did who knows what. I was messed up, I knew it, and I was in trouble. I had a phone charger, but nothing to plug it into as well. I considered the worst, but also the most obvious answer. 
I had to play nice the entire night and pray that nothing else would happen, charge the phone at their place, get an Uber in the morning and leave as calmly as possible so that as not to raise any suspicion. I had to play along and I genuinely just couldn't think of any other plan. I wondered if I was going to choke on my own vomit and die at any point as I was still blacking out and throwing up at this point and these strangers were clearly not going to take me to get medical help. I wondered if I would get assaulted tonight and even with birth control if I would suffer further consequences like pregnancy or an STI. I wondered if he'd try to keep me as a prisoner, hurt me or even maybe kill me. Easily the most painful part was the realization that I felt truly so stupid, so pathetic, so worthless and miserable in this moment in my life that maybe I, I just didn't care anymore. It felt like I had no one and nothing anyway, even though it wasn't entirely true. In the moment, it really did seem that way. But then, as stupid as it sounds, I remembered my cat. I remember the moment that I first held her when she was weeks old, eyes closed and I fed her a warm bottle of milk. I thought about her now and how she sometimes would sit by the door and cry for me when I left for work because she was so attached and hated being without me. And what would she do without me? Would she know why I never came home that night? I made the decision that I had to survive this night so that I could hold her again. I re-entered that mode, that mode of no feelings, no thoughts, no anxiety, no panic, nothing. Just be extremely calm, nice even and smile until I find myself sober and capable of getting out of this situation. At this point, I was still coming in and out of consciousness when I felt the car come to a stop. I couldn't really sit upright without triggering more vomiting, but I remember attempting to slightly raise my head just enough to see we were in front of some small rundown home, I think. The guy sitting next to me, the one that had insisted that I go home with him, had been holding my hair back while I puked and told me now that this is his place and we're going to go inside. I tried one more time to tell him that I should go back to my apartment and my roommates must be wondering where I am. Again, he didn't even seem to take me seriously though, kind of just chuckled and just said, come on, let's go. And I told him that I was too sick and weak to walk and wanted to just stay in the car instead and... I don't think that I could even walk the short distance to the door, to be honest. He said that he would carry me there, and I still said that I couldn't do it. Everything was blurry, my spatial sense and visions were that of a sailor in a tiny boat traveling through a massive storm, a shaking, whirling, rocking mess. I remember my muscles trembling and my empty stomach clenching. I felt the cold air as he opened the door on my side and sort of just grabbed me and pulled me out. I felt my feet stumble on the pavement and weakly try to balance myself, but my head still could raise upright and I remember looking straight up and leaning against his chest to keep from crashing to the ground. At this point, I actually started saying, no, I can't do this, I'm going to puke, I just can't do this, and sobbing because just walking those 10 or 15 feet felt as if I were on the most frightening roller coaster ever designed. He just kept hushing me though and telling me to quiet down. Things go blurry for a bit after this and I remember bits and pieces. I remember having a Gatorade put to my lips and encouraging me to drink it. Then at some point I realized that I was laying flat on my back on his bed and the lights were off with just a little bit of light coming from under his bedroom door and he was standing at the foot of it. I broke down hard at this point and started crying harder than I had at any point before. My body was like lead though. I couldn't move a muscle. I was physically trying to and my body just wasn't responding, which said to me that this wasn't just alcohol. But this was it, I thought. I'd been hurt so many times before, slapped, knocked around, grabbed, hurt, you name it. But I always felt a sense of relief that I'd never been sexually assaulted. But this, this may be the night. It was probably going to happen and I couldn't do anything about it. I wanted to scream in that moment, but I didn't know what I could say that wouldn't be some kind of accusation and could trigger rage, violence and things unimaginable. I tried to think of ways to communicate my lack of consent and fear in this moment without accusing him of what it seemed he was about to do. All I could think of was to say, please don't hurt me, 
in a weak whisper, barely loud enough to be heard over and over again as the tears poured down my cheeks. He hushed me again and told me to just go to sleep and then laid down next to me. An hour or so would go by of quiet and then he'd wake up and start kissing me. I laid there still frozen in fear as he did this, hazy but conscious, tolerating it only knowing what harm I was risking by reacting too strongly and loudly in dissent if it displeased him. He touched me on my chest and my bra several times and crooned about how I was just his type. But when he tried to reach into my leggings, I just started to sob all over again and beg, please don't hurt me. And to my surprise, he would give up after a bit of this, but seemed frustrated. I realized that he was messed up enough to abduct a drunk girl against her will and have her all alone in his bed, paralyzed and terrified for him to take advantage of. But that sobbing and pleading for mercy was some kind of a turnoff, I think. This would repeat itself several times in the night, and I barely slept, but I made it through to the morning clothed and untouched below the waist. When morning came, I was sober enough to sit up and talk coherently. I tried my hardest to be extremely calm and casual. He nudged me to wake me up, and I asked if he could drive me back to my place and drop me off. He said that he could, but wanted to meet up with his friends from the night before and grab some pho at a nearby restaurant. I just smiled and nodded and said again that I was ready to go home and my roommates must be worried. He drove me to the restaurant and despite this and his gall to ignore my request again to be dropped off, I realized as I sat in a busy restaurant surrounded by people in broad daylight that I was alert, sober and in a public place. I had a chance to break free. I continually pushed for him to drive me home because my phone was still dead and I didn't know who else would help at this point. All through this meal, I was so close to freedom that it was all I cared about. So I joked and smiled and played along, thinking at every second that passed that soon I would be home with my cat and my roommates and safe again. He asked for my number, just as he began heading back to the car and I said, Oh, I don't know, but... When he pushed, I gave it to him, thinking that I was so close to getting out of here and I wasn't going to mess that up now and tick him off or anything. When I made it to my apartment, I stumbled in, embraced my roommates and started sobbing and apologizing. I said that I was a reckless idiot. I made a huge mistake. I'm lucky to be alive and I'm sorry for being so stupid. I told them what happened and how ashamed I felt for putting myself in that position, but they comforted me and told me that I had just been kidnapped against my will and that none of this was my own doing, that there are sick people and it wasn't my fault. Before any of this happened, I had a long list of trauma and I cannot truly say that this was the event that broke me because I think that I was broken long before that night, but I know that it has only made everything worse. Many other things have also happened since to compound the issue, unfortunately. At one point, I was hospitalized, and I'm grateful for it. Things started to get a lot better after that, but I can't say that I'm even close to being mended. I just recently began seeing a therapist again, and I've opened up about the person and all of this trauma has made me into, and I isolate myself constantly and have become somewhat agoraphobic, rarely leaving my apartment. But when I do go out, it is never alone anymore, and I never drink. I often use virtual reality social games to meet people these days and have social experiences because it's really the only time that I truly feel safe. I like knowing that I can always take the headset off, log out, that's it. I do hope that one day I can again find myself open, talking to my loved ones about my emotions and able to spend time with others outside of my two roommates in real life, but I'm just not there yet. But all in all, I'm thankful that I got lucky that night, that nothing truly horrible really happened to me, and please, if you're going through something, reach out to other people and get the support that you need. Don't be like me, and don't take the risks that I took, because you may not get as lucky as I was. So my mother and myself decided to visit Nevada City CA on a whim. 
It's an old-timey Victorian-era mining or logging town built in 1856. You can look at pictures on Google if you really want to see a creepy town. It looks haunted without even having to try, to be honest. But after eating lunch at a brew pub, we decided to stroll around the massive Pioneer Historical Cemetery on the outskirts of town. It wasn't quite dusk yet, but the trees are really tall in this area, so daylight is hard to gauge, and it usually feels later than it is. This cemetery was sprawling, and I mean, most pioneer cemeteries are because of the high mortality rate of the time, but this had lots of child graves. As we progress through the cemetery, though, it starts like a proper cemetery with large, ornate tombs, mausoleums, marble obelisks, family plots, etc. But what's wild about this particular cemetery is that it stretches on almost forever into the woods. Spooky, but this isn't a paranormal story. You see, as we follow the cemetery deeper and deeper into the woods, it becomes hard to tell what's a grave or not, and it's getting more wild and sort of overgrown. It eventually devolved into just wilderness, really, with the occasional sign of homeless camps like abandoned tents, bags of trash, etc. Luckily, the trees were opening up and more daylight was coming through, and we ended up in an open area with a large solitary juniper tree tall brush and a few random graves around as well. I sort of tripped over something at some point and it turned out to be a purse, like a large designer purse and it looked super old like it had been there for a while. Looking up from the purse about maybe 10 yards ahead I saw what looked like a pile of women's clothing but then I noticed to my horror a tangled mass of hair and at that I froze. You ever know something without actually knowing something? I knew that this was a dead woman's body, down to my core. I put a hand out and stopped my mum, who was trailing behind me. Get your phone, call the police. That's a dead body over there. And she immediately started dialing 911 because, like me, she just knew too. But this, this is where it just gets crazy. You see, as my mum and I are discussing the situation, we had our attention turned away from the corpse. When we look back at the body, I swear that she was sitting up with her back turned to us. She was wearing a bright red trench coat and she had super grimy blonde hair that was more standing up than laying on her shoulders. It's like the grime in her hair allowed it to sort of defy gravity if you catch my drift and... Slowly, she turned her head over her shoulder like something out of a horror movie and spotted us. She literally jumped to her feet lightning fast and turned to face us. Her front was a mess of torn clothing and she was barely covered. In the weirdest gait that I'd ever seen, she rapidly advanced on us in a jerking sort of lurching fashion. Her hands were desperately trying to keep herself covered. My first thought was that she had been assaulted. She kept trying to speak to us, but it was like she couldn't form words, only make sort of high-pitched squeaks. As she closed in on me, she stopped and pointed down in excitement at the purse that I had tripped over. I asked if it was hers, and when I did, her expression changed into a horrible smirk. It still haunts me when I think of it, and suddenly she was slowly starting to undress herself, and we had to shout to her to, to stop it. By this point, we had the cops on the way, the dispatcher had heard everything, and we said that we had found someone in serious distress. Be that as it may, we both knew that it was not a safe situation for us, and we quickly backed away, turned, and we booked it out of there. When we eventually followed up with the police out of concern, and to be honest, curiosity too, they said that whoever we had found, they must have fled because they never did find her. I really do hope to God that whoever that person was, that she's okay and that she gets the help that she needs because she was obviously not all there. November 13, 2011 is when my mum went crazy. My parents were married for 21 years. My mum has always had her demons, but... For a long time, she at least tried. Sometime in 2006 or 2007, after I went off to college, she went off her meds for depression for 
who knows the how manyth time. But this time was different. I didn't realize what mania looked like at that time. I was only 18 after all, but years later I realized that she had an adult onset of bipolar disorder. And man, it was unnerving to say the least. It was the last straw for my dad and he left. The divorce was finalized in 2008. My mum was never the same too. I think the combination of borderline personality disorder and bipolar disorder, both diagnosed, meant watching her go up and down on a haunting roller coaster of destruction, also meant watching the small part of her that was a mother fade away. My dad left her the house, the one that we had lived in all my life. It's a beautiful home too, cozy and on the corner. There's a big bay window and natural light and it's always felt like home, until the divorce that is. I hated being in that house after my dad left. Her behavior became more erratic and the lows became so much lower and the house began to change too. It was dark and stale and you just couldn't wait to leave. I've always chalked it up to my perception as a young adult weathering a divorce and my mum's downward spiral but now I don't know. You see it got worse and worse over time and, and then I got a phone call on November 13, 2011. I was living in another city. The call was from my father telling me that a neighbor noticed that he hadn't seen my dog in the bay window for several days and decided to use the spare key my mother had given him. The dog was found dead in the bathroom and my mother in bed, weak and frail. She had laid in the bed for so long that her leg muscles had atrophied. The dog... I've never really been able to get answers on, but my sister once let it slip that there was blood. The cleaners that my aunt hired to clean the house also found my cat three days into the job, crushed to death between the ottoman and the chair in the back room. She spent the next few years in a catatonic state, first in the mental hospital and then she was transferred to a nursing home. In the meantime, I was the one to clean up the house. She was a shopaholic hoarder to say the least and mental illness had only amplified it too. The first time that I came back home, it felt dark and stale but it was empty. It didn't have the panicked pressure that I had felt with my mother there. I sorted and cleaned, sorted more and cleaned more and sorted and cleaned even more. The more I did this, the lighter and brighter it became until it felt like home again I guess not really, but kind of. There was always a bit of staleness there that I just couldn't get rid of, but I attributed, and perhaps still do, it to my subconscious awareness of what had happened there. One thing that I did notice about the house, though, was that the lightness could become dark in the blink of an eye, and everything was gradual, if that makes sense. Like, you never noticed things until you were consumed by the stale darkness that was there. It was sort of like a cloak coming over the place in one steady sweep. It was odd, but, I mean, how can you explain it apart from just psychological, right? I had a boyfriend too, and our relationship wasn't exactly healthy to begin with, but I will say that he noticed the same things that I did with the house. And there were three specific incidences within that house that I would like to share. So one day, it was me, him, and one of his friends sitting in the middle room when... We heard the distinct sound of the front door opening. They went to go and check and it was closed with no sign of being opened. The thing about the door is that as it was old like the rest of the house, the door had become difficult to open and close. In order to open it, you had to put your shoulder into it in fact, but in order to close it, you had to thrust your body weight against it several times sometimes before it would shut. We heard it open, but... The weirdest thing is that we never actually heard it shut. To us, this just seemed impossible. And I mean, three people heard the exact same thing, so it wasn't like we misheard it. The second incident was my ex and I were sitting in the middle room once again. We were in our office chairs at our desks, talking about something, when we distinctly heard several creaks overhead and a sudden smash directly, and I mean directly over my head in the attic. It was as if someone took several steps until they were overhead and had either a plate or something glass and threw it with great force. The sound was so incredibly clear and 
My ex and I locked eyes with each other and we whispered, There's someone in the attic. I was gone. I bolted out to the garage and backed my car out and parked in the driveway. My ex came out to meet me and convinced me to stay where I was in the car as he called his best friend. The same one who heard the front door open and not open and asked him to come with his gun so that they could search the attic. His best friend arrived in less than two minutes with his weapon. They both went inside the house and searched the place from top to bottom as I sat in the driveway. The way that this home was set up was that it was on a corner lot like I said. The side gate faced the street and there was a bay window that wrapped around the house and sort of stretched almost to the front door. We still had the blinds pulled up. This meant that from my vantage point I could see inside half of the house and if anyone exited through the only two exits in the home, the front door and the side gate, I could even see the back fence from where I was. I would have definitely seen them. I could even see the roof in fact. It was not a large home by any means too and I would have been able to see anyone if they were making an escape. As I waited for the boys to return, I half expected to see a homeless man scramble out of the house at one point. I mean, it was really the only thing that could explain the sound of something being thrown right above my head. The boys completed the search of the home, but there was nothing, and nobody was to be found. I asked if they had checked the attic. Thoroughly, they said. I believe them too. But the thing about the attic of that house is that it wasn't sort of a true attic. The rafters were set up in such a way that a person could not really walk around freely up there. If they did, they would fall through the ceiling. There was a light switch up there too and the boys had examined every square inch of the attic and there was no sign of life to be found. And in fact, there wasn't even any glass. Nothing. Now, it would be easy to write that off as just a strange sound that the old house had made if it wasn't for one thing my boyfriend was insistent on, the footsteps that he had heard leading up to the crash. He was adamant. He had heard the footsteps above him as they walked to the spot right above me. He had heard the wood slightly creak as if something had lifted its arm up to throw something with force. I wear hearing aids, so I miss out on a lot of those sorts of sounds, but... I had heard the creaking before the smash, and I knew by then when my boyfriend was being sincere. I believe him even to this day as to hearing those footsteps. Now the third thing that happened was we were in the house for two or three years. I split my time between there and down south for college. My boyfriend, he stayed behind in the house and he would mention that there were times that he just knew that he wasn't alone, but no other specific incidences took place. But the house began to get darker and our fights grew worse and more violent. Something happened to my mind and it all happened gradually until it was just horrible. A point of no return in fact. To this day the depression that I felt there was like nothing I've ever experienced before. And it changed me. After one particularly savage fight too I went for a drive and came back. I was alone. He wasn't there. I entered through the back door and... I was greeted by a wall of darkness. It was stale, cold and dark in there, even though all the lights were on and I could barely breathe. I snapped and I yelled at the darkness in the kitchen for no particular reason. Get out, go away, I see you, go, I'm sick of you. And to my absolute horror, it actually retreated. I swear to you on my son that I visibly saw the darkness shift backwards. I screamed at it some more and it retreated some more and there was light again. The house was light and beautiful again. Now, the weirdest thing is that after this, my memory just seems to stop there. In the kitchen screaming at the darkness. Because the next thing that I remember is that I was waking up in my bed, fully clothed on top of the sheets. The house is dark again, the staleness is there again, but when I walk into the kitchen, it's light and bright. Oddly enough, that was the first time that I considered the possibility that there might actually be something more to that house, that there might be something otherworldly there, but what, I don't know. Not too long after the incident in the kitchen too, I left the house and it was put up for sale. I have been through many tough and trying times since then, but I have never experienced the darkness, the sluggishness, the staleness, the pressure, the panic the hopelessness, the bleakness and the agony of that home since then. My gut tells me that there's something there. 
My rationalism is willing to concede that it could all be subconsciously rooted in the pain associated with the home's history. I admit that, but I feel that there truly is or was something dark and dangerous within that home. And I only wonder if it was there when my mother moved in with my father or if she created it with her downward spiral. I had a reoccurring dream while in that house too, where I would walk into the middle room and see something that resembled a, a cross between the creature from Alien and Predator, and it would lock eyes with me, and I would hear in my mind, Window Sullivan, and the dream would end. There's no one in my family with the name Sullivan, and I'm unsure if it's connected, probably not, but I never had that dream again after leaving that home, which is really weird. So... All in all, I've never been able to really explain what might be in there, and it didn't seem to fit typical ghost tales. I'm not sure why I wonder if my mother created it, it's just something that's popped into my head every time that I think about that house. I'm open to any suggestions or thoughts, but I am 100% committed to the experiences that I had here, and I swear by them. This event happened over the weekend while I was home from college for my mum's birthday. On Saturday night, I had a couple of beers with my girlfriend who was spending the weekend at our house because my parents are super chill. At about 12.30pm, maybe a few minutes after my parents went to bed, I went out to the back porch to grab a couple more beers for myself and my girlfriend who was waiting in the basement where we planned to watch Game of Thrones for a while before going to sleep. I opened the back door and stepped into the back porch and immediately, the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end and I felt like I was being watched from the tree line. My back porch overlooks the backyard which leads directly into thick woods. I didn't think too much of it at first to be honest because I always feel a little bit spooked going outside at night but as I opened the cooler, I heard it. In my mind, it was unmistakable. It was the agonizing screams of what sounded like my next door neighbor and her teenage daughter. I won't say their names because, you know, internet creeps and all that. But what's even more terrifying is that I swear that they were screaming a very specific thing. Sam, help us, please. Sam, help. That's my name. Now, I was already intoxicated and on edge, but I turned around without the beers and locked the door behind me as I went back inside because that, that was just too much. Then I heard my mum's voice calling from upstairs, asking me if I heard it. I responded yes and asked if she knew what it was. She didn't have a clear answer, only speculation, but she knew for a fact that our neighbours were both inside their home. In other words, whoever that was, that sounded exactly like my neighbours, who were screaming for help, that was not actually them. When my twin and I were growing up, we lived in a home on Cemetery Road, and believe it or not, we actually lived next to a cemetery as well. We had a stepmom who befriended our neighbor, and this neighbor was into some spooky stuff. And one day after school, my twin and I walked into our room to this chick messing with a Ouija board. We started yelling at her, asking her, why and what are you doing and why are you in here? She simply said, if you're religious, you should probably pray, then proceeded to tell us that she spoke with a spirit named Alex that lived in our home. She left and she didn't come back for two weeks. During those weeks, nothing happened too. We felt relieved about that to be honest. I was one of those kids who couldn't watch a scary movie without it affecting me, so when I saw what she was doing, I got pretty spooked. I mean, I've seen all the scary movies of Ouija boards, and they mean bad news, right? Then she came back. She walked into our kitchen, and the pots and pans just flew out of the kitchen right at her. She then told my stepmom, and she said, I don't believe in any of this stuff, but you know, the landlord's mum died here, and her name was Alexandra. And it was at this point that things really started happening. But I wanted to share one particular experience that I had growing up in that house because this one never left me. So it's not just my twin and I that lived there. There were six of us and on this particular day, our little sister was at our mum's and our stepbrothers were at their friend's house. That neighbor's house, she actually had a son. 
and then we had a six month brother that was home and our dad was out on a business trip I think. Anyways, it's just me, my twin and our little baby brother. Our stepmom got up at 5.30 in the morning to go job searching and it was my twin's turn to go upstairs to listen for our brother when he woke up. After our stepmom left at like 5.45, I started to feel, I don't know, like uneasy and scared. My stomach twisted and I started to feel nauseous in fact. I could feel like something was watching me so I went upstairs to go sleep next to my sister and I made sure that I shut the door behind me. Now, this is an old house, admittedly, and everything creaks, and when someone is walking through the house, you can hear it. It's very loud. But I started to feel scared again, so I tried to wake my sister up, but she was out cold. And then, I started hearing stomping up the stairs, like someone is running or walking very fast. I'm crying at this point, trying to shake my sister awake, but she just won't wake up, then I tell myself, it's just Bethany, she forgot her coat or something. The door of the bedroom starts to open, and when it opens fully, there's nobody there. At least, nobody that I could see. Then I heard stomping going towards our little brother, and I got up so quickly and ran straight over there, snatched him up and then ran back to the bed. And the moment that I sat down on the bed, my sister woke up to me crying, and the stomping, it disappeared. A lot of things happened in that house, but that was definitely the scariest experience that I'd ever had there, and it still gives me the spooks when I think about it. Now, stepmom to this day tells me that I just dreamt it, but I know for a fact that I was not dreaming and I was not asleep. I grew up in a town in Dallas-Fort Worth area, but moved away for college. I just wanted a more liberal setting, chalk it up as youthful idealism I guess, but I moved to the northeast to go to a school and I would come back every holiday and summer to my folks place and catch up with friends, you know, the whole college sort of summer thing. So my college was very uneventful for the most part. I wasn't much of a school spirit kind of guy and I just wanted to get it over with so I could go back home because after three years of school, the youthful idealism gave way to reality pretty quickly. But one summer night, we're at the local college bar and I meet up with a girl that I've known since like elementary school. We go out for drinks and she just kept talking about this one guy who had always hit on her at the bar. So me, a six foot guy built fairly well, would be on the lookout for creeps and that's when I saw him. He was a white male, bald, not at all intimidating to look at, just like an average looking guy I guess, but he looked older than us. I chalked it up to the bald head, but the thing that did creep me out was his gaze. It was like he was looking at you, but through you. He made small talk with her and she introduced me to him and he pretty much just went on his way. She turns and looks at me and says, that's the creep. I leave it alone and don't think too much of it and I go on about my night. But then, two months later, that's when I get this call. The guy was no ordinary guy after all. He was arrested for murder and the details of the murder were so horrific that it made me literally uneasy. It's been years since then and I do wonder about that guy. I think about the girl who lost her life in such a tragic way and the soulless gaze of that man who did such a horrible thing. I have a family of my own now and I couldn't imagine getting that call. It's something that I think about every time my wife or daughter leave the house now and it always just makes me feel really uneasy. Last week I was pretty excited to go on a tour of an abandoned schoolhouse near my home. It was closed for like 12 years and it was a very gloomy place. But the tour promised a paranormal experience and it wasn't really like that though I guess. When I arrived there, there was a sort of Beetlejuice narrator that was guiding the whole thing. It was a very dirty and smelly place and I hoped for the worst. But then when it started, all my illusion fell and the whole tour was a more theatrical, sort of an insight into kind of like exorcisms, I guess. And so instead of feeling disappointed, I was actually very grateful because I had a lot of fun during the whole play. 
The next day I was cooking some lunch for the family and I decided to get some water from the fridge and the water was at room temperature because my brother didn't fill the water jar on time. And when I let it sit on the table to get a cup, the jar just exploded and I got like three pieces in me. I decided to clean it all up before someone noticed, but then I realized that it was very difficult that this happened because the jar was at room temperature and like I said, it just seemed to sort of explode out of nowhere. This was only the start too because every day something different happened. Like yesterday when all the plants that I took care of for years, they just withered out of nowhere. Or on the weekend when I started to hear the doorknobs of the rooms that were already opened sort of rattling around. Or people walking on the second floor when nobody's around. My family is kind of concerned by the situation but they're waiting for everything to just sort of settle down. I guess they just hope that it will sort itself out. I really don't know what's happening but I sort of determined in my own mind that there must be something paranormal going on, something following me to my house from this location that I had gone to and it's causing all of these unexpected events. And I guess my question for all of you guys is, does anyone know what any of this means and should I be worried? When I was a little girl in primary school, I was really close with a group of boys. We would play fight in breaks or pretend to be dragons and the group was quite solid. I was friends with a lot of my class in primary but I wasn't a fan of sitting around and talking like the girls did. My best friend, or one of them, at the time was Tommy. I don't remember too much about him but we had been friends since year two. We would play fight and he would add to ideas for my dragon club. I went to his house once or twice and he went to mine. He called me thick once because I said in my woke six-year-old mind that there are no boy colors or girl colors and I could like green if I wanted and he could pink. It was a pretty normal friendship but then when I was in my last year, year six, my parents decided to move countries. On one of my last days, Tommy confesses his feelings for me, but very awkwardly like a little boy would and I played it off just as awkwardly. I think in my memory that I pretended to say to him that I thought that he was talking about another girl. And well, I moved, and as expected from anyone other than me, I didn't remain in contact with a lot of my class, including Tommy. Life went on as it does, I went through high school and made new friends. Tommy requested me once on Facebook when I was 15. He was using a fake account, which was a little weird, but I didn't think much of it. He sent me photos of himself telling me that he was trying to get into modeling. Not something that I expected from him, but I was supportive nonetheless. In fact, I remember thinking that he was kind of attractive and showed my friends for opinion. Besides that though, there really was no more conversations with Tommy and we continued to just live separate lives. That is, until I moved back to my home country. I followed my parents back home after staying behind for two years. I was 19 turning 20 and was excited to build life back home. It had been so difficult by myself and I had no other family in the country and had just split up with my ex of four years. I was doing okay. I had gotten a new job, entered a new relationship, moved into my own place. I was starting to feel established in my life. I had met up with a few old friends from primary school. Nothing too exciting, just more of where they are now type thing. I just love getting to see who all these kids had grown up to be. That is, until I got a message request from Tommy. It was the same nonsense as before. No profile pic, no friends, nothing on their account, so I messaged back asking how they knew me. Sure enough, he said that we went to primary school together. The conversation started normal, asking how each other were and what was new. Then he asked me, whereabouts are you? do you want to meet up? Now, there was nothing unusual about these messages, but the vibe that I got just wasn't comfortable. I said that I was busy and would happily organize when things had calmed down. He began to talk about how he wanted to go into working with cybercrime and terrorism, telling me to watch Mr. Robot and how realistic to his job that would be. I got busy and eventually I stopped responding, to which he said, are you going to respond or what? 
that bristled me a bit, so I replied saying that I didn't appreciate his tone. He apologized and in the same message asked where I work and that he would like to see me. But my bad vibes picked up again though. Usually I don't care about telling people where I work, but this time I made sure to be as broad as possible, saying that it's just in a shop in town. It would be cool to catch up when I'm not busy. I'll just have to check with my boyfriend that he's cool with me meeting up. And instantly, he got defensive, asking if my boyfriend was in the country, telling me I'm not property so I should do what I want. He sent multiple messages how it's beyond him why I would have to check since I'm not even married. I didn't respond to any of it, but the next day, he apologized and said that he was just jealous and depressed. I pointed out that it had been 10 years since I'd seen him, so his jealousy just made no sense. He said that it was my loss if I didn't see him, and I didn't respond. But then, it was, I'm free any time didn't respond again. Suddenly, he messaged me saying that he was going to hack my details and sell them on the darknet if I didn't respond to him. It was at this point that I just blocked him. I was rather amused at the entire situation if I'm being honest, but then I got a message from a random girl, obviously a fake account with no friends or photos bar the online selfie that looked like it was straight out of Tumblr or something. And the message read, You blocked me, you dumb cow. You know who this is, and I'll find you. I laughed it off, and I didn't respond, but then he started commenting on my profile pictures, calling me a slag and a whore and all of that. Then came the multiple accounts, request after request popping up, all called, I'll find you. It was at this point, too, that I was beginning to get pretty freaked out. But for the sake of poor timing, though, A silver beat-up car started patrolling my street at night for some weird reason. I live in a complex on the third floor, so it's a shared driveway, and this car would drive into my parking lot, stay for two minutes, and then just drive away. It did this routinely for a few days, and I don't know by any means if this is Tommy or not, but the timing was way too close, and it really did creep me out. After a while, I didn't see it again, so I assumed that if it was him, he must have given up. Either way, though, every time that he's tried to contact me, I just block him. I was visiting my friend in Budapest that was working at a hostel. We ended up going out and drinking pretty heavily and meeting these two girls. We hung out with them through the night and offered to walk them back to their place. When we got there, my friend, who had a girl on lock, was like, Ah, I'll come back with you, Andrew. I just kept being like, Dude, you've got a girl that wants you to come up to her place and it's a short walk from here to get home. Just stay. He kept saying no and I jokingly was like, Well, you can't leave with me if you can't find me. And just started running away. I'm a pretty stupid drunk, I know that, but it was funny at the time, but anyways, I ran for a few minutes and quickly lost my bearings, had an empty wallet and no phone. I just thought, ah crap, I'll wander, spot a landmark and find my way home from there. Hell, I'll sleep on the street if I have to. I was walking for 30 minutes at this point, really, really drunk. A car pulled up and a guy yelled at me in Hungarian. I just replied, sorry man, English only, and I laughed. He was parked and I was chilling, so we talked for a few minutes. He seemed alright and was like, dude, I can take you back to your hostel if you'd like. I said yes to this and I went to hop in the back. And there were two guys back there that I couldn't see through the tinted windows. These guys were both super tatted up and very thug looking I was honestly just too drunk to run if they were going to rob me, so I put on a brave face and I got in. I'm sobering up really fast, they start driving, and I immediately realize that something is definitely going on. Basically, Budapest was two separate cities on either side of the river, Buda and Pest. We were on the Pest side, with most of the clubs and such, and we almost immediately crossed over and... I knew that I didn't live on that side, so I was kind of like, 
Uh, hey man, uh, my hostel's in Pest. Why are you going into Buddha? And they all just laugh and go quiet again. Finally, the driver pipes up and says, Hey man, no one knows where you were tonight. What would you do if we tried to beat you up? And they're all laughing. I check my door handle and it's child locked. I kind of feign being sick and roll down my window, slightly leaning out. The whole time they're talking, saying that they could kill me and no one would even know. That I didn't even know where I was. I just remember looking at my feet and being like... If you guys try anything tonight, I know you'll hurt me or maybe even kill me, but I promise that I'll kill one of you with me. I swear in my life that I'll make it happen. And they laughed. We keep getting further out of the city, almost to the point of no buildings. We keep going back and forth with the threats when we hit a red light. Everyone in the car was kind of at ease since they thought that I was too drunk to do anything. I leaned out the window, grabbed the handle from the outside, popped the door open and I fell backwards onto the pavement, rolled and just started running. The car was stopped for a second but I was shouting so they just peeled away. It was around 4 or 5am at this point and I find some guy playing Pokemon Go. This was like when it was peak time so there were a lot of people out there who looked terrified that this bleeding drunk guy is approaching. I explain my situation though and they're super sympathetic, but they call me a cab and I take the cab back to the hostel. All I had was 20 Canadian dollars in my wallet and I beg the driver to just take it. He does. I get to my room as the sun rises. My friend asked what happened and apparently I just said that got kidnapped, uh, sleep, uh, oh, I'll tell you tomorrow alright, and passed out in my bed. This event took place in Germany in the summer of 2017. I was on a holiday with my family, parents and younger brother, and were due to stay in a small apartment for a few days near Lake Constance. After a long journey from England, we arrived at the destination, a small guest house with a few rooms and a separate apartment complex. As we arrived late, the kitchen had closed and we didn't have any food with us so we had to skip dinner. We then went over to our apartment to unpack and just rest for a bit. Nothing seemed off about the apartment at first glance. Everything seemed to just be in order and it didn't seem to have any bad vibe at all. I did notice, however, that the cable connecting the TV to the wall had been severed, almost like something had chewed through it or something. I didn't think too much of it as the TV was quite small and there probably wasn't too much in the way of any decent channels anyway. Once we had unpacked, we went to the bar around the corner that was open late for a couple of drinks. My brother and I had left our phones at the apartment, so I went back to retrieve them from the safe. And this is when things began to get a bit strange. So, I went over to the safe to get the phones. I had operated the safe before and knew the code and how to open it. This time, however, it just wouldn't open. I entered the code and pressed the unlock button, but nothing happened. I kept repeating this and nothing happened and while doing this I began to get this feeling that someone was just standing behind me but every time I turned around no one was there. I was then overcome with this dizziness and almost a, an electric feeling as if I was being pumped full of electricity. It occurred for a few seconds all the while I felt as if I couldn't move and that someone was behind me. The feeling wore off though and I looked around to see nothing there. I tried the safe again and this time it opened. I went back to the bar and I told my family what had happened. They were a bit taken aback and didn't know what to make of it. We all returned to the apartment though just before midnight and that's when things began to get even weirder. So there were two bedrooms to this apartment. My brother and I were sharing one and my parents were in the double bedroom. My brother complained that he felt sick and he went to go sleep with my parents. A few minutes later though, he was being violently sick in the toilet. My mum was panicking because of the amount of sick that he was retching up. More horrifyingly though, the colour of this sick was just jet black. He hadn't eaten much that day and he didn't consume anything of that colour, so it was weird. 
but he immediately felt better after the ordeal, and then we just all went to bed. Being someone who believes in the supernatural, but also being fairly rational, I tried my best to reassure myself that there was probably just a logical explanation for all of this. This was made difficult, however, by the events that followed. So, despite the windows being open, my room just felt unnaturally hot. The outside temperature wasn't particularly warm, so I found this somewhat strange. Seeing as I couldn't sleep, I decided to go on my phone for a bit. The Wi-Fi, which had been fine earlier, just didn't seem to work. Most of the electric seemed to work one minute and then just not the next, and it could have been faulty wiring maybe, but something just seemed off to me. I put my phone on charge and sat at the table across the room, and the overhead lamp didn't work at first, but after flipping the switch a few times, it eventually turned itself on. I grabbed the pen and the paper that was on the table and began writing out football scores. Not something that I would usually do, but I was bored and didn't know what else to write. After about five minutes of doing this, the light began to flicker though. I didn't worry about it too much, and I just carried on writing. But what happened next, I will never forget. I began to feel just overcome by this peculiar energy. An electric feeling similar to what I had experienced early on that night. I was unable to move, and... I just couldn't take my eyes off the piece of paper that I'd been writing on. The electric energy surged through my body and everything around me was blurred out as all my attention was focused onto the paper in front of me. The writing and the numbers that I had written on the piece of paper slowly began to turn into a, a foreign language. The writing was kind of Latin looking and was like nothing I'd really ever seen before. I believe that it was possibly gothic script, a, a script that is hundreds of years old and was used in Western Europe. It was a surreal experience, and I don't know how long the ordeal lasted, but it seemed like a long time. I was dazed and confused. I didn't know what to do with myself, so eventually I just went back to bed. After a few hours of sleep, though, I woke up to what sounded like a, a low-pitched growling. Thinking that I was half asleep, I gave myself a few seconds to adjust. I realized that I was now fully awake and I could still hear the noise. It sounded like it was coming from under the bed as well. At this, I hid under the covers, trying desperately to control my breathing and not freak out. The growling didn't sound like that of a dog or anything. It sounded like something, uh, honestly, uh, I've never heard before. I was now starting to realize that there was no real explanation for any of this activity though. This place must be haunted by something, possibly dark, and it wanted us straight out of there. But it was right when I was having these thoughts that that was when I felt air blowing on my feet, which were exposed to sticking out from under the sheets. I froze, hoping that my mind was just playing tricks on me in my paranoid state. But I was wrong. Warm, damp air was being blown onto my feet from something. It was unmistakable, and it felt as if a, a dog was sat at the end of my bed, breathing heavily on my feet. I curled up into a ball instantly and hid myself under the covers completely, hoping that it would stop. During the early hours, though, I heard what sounded like barking or something like that coming from right outside of my window. The windows were open in my room, and this was a ground floor apartment. Eventually, I plucked up enough courage and I grabbed my phone, put the torch on and I ran to the window to see what was outside. I could still hear the barking and growling as I approached the window and as soon as I looked outside, the noises just stopped. It couldn't have been a dog because not only did it not sound like one, but it also stopped as soon as I shone my phone torch outside. It just wouldn't have had time to have gotten out of sight as... There was nowhere to hide. Once again, though, I felt a presence behind me. I spun around and shone my torch around the room, hoping to catch something, but I couldn't see anything. It was now about four in the morning, and honestly, I just wanted to get some sleep. I was scared, but I was also getting irritated because I was just so exhausted. So I got back into bed, and I just drifted off to sleep. 
When I woke up, it was late morning. Everybody else was awake. I asked them if they heard any weird noises coming from my room, and they said that they didn't. My mum, however, said that she heard a growling and a barking coming from the back of the apartment, similar to what I had actually heard. She said that she thought that it was probably just a dog, and she just went back to sleep. She said that she also heard music coming from outside the window, and it was a creepy kind of melodic sounding tune being played on a string instrument of some sort. Everyone was growing tired of the place though and we all decided that it was best to just leave and find somewhere else to stay. My brother was still a bit traumatized from his ordeal the night before. He was also alarmed by what I had experienced and didn't want to stay another night. The staff back at the main guest house weren't happy that we were leaving and demanded that we pay the full price. My dad argued that the place was in a bad state considering the appliances weren't working properly and he didn't mention the strange activity though, and we eventually left that afternoon and found a new place to stay for the remainder of our trip. This place was bed and breakfast and was much nicer. To be honest though, we were happy to just be away from that other place. Unfortunately, the rest of the trip didn't really go to plan. My dad became ill and was in bed with a fever for a couple of days. He said that it was like nothing he'd ever had before and would have these hallucinations of the previous place that we stayed at. He also heard creepy voices talking to him and this subsided once the fever disappeared and he made a full recovery almost instantly, which was kind of weird. On the journey home, my mum was also violently sick, worryingly so, because this sick was black, the same colour as my brother's. I then began to feel really sick on the final part of the journey as we got back to England. Not long after we got back to our house too, I also had to run to the bathroom and was sick rather violently. This meant that all four of us had now been ill since staying at that apartment. I don't know what was going on with that apartment that we stayed in, but it sure as hell wasn't friendly. I try and convince myself that it wasn't anything sort of demonic in nature, but it's hard to think of what else it could have been or what it could have done if we'd stayed longer. My family is just as creeped out by this as I am, as are the other people that we've told. The only thing that is certain, though, is that... We'll never be returning to that place ever again.